Starting council or budget first. Okay. Good morning, uh, folks. Uh, it is June the 9th, 2000, 2020, and um, we're beginning our meeting. First of all, we're doing a budget um, uh, this morning, and uh, then we will go into uh, council when we finished uh, the budget, depending on how long that that takes. Uh, so I'll call the meeting to order, and uh, as is our custom, let's just uh, make sure we have folks with us and folks at home can see what they look like. Councillor Stretch. Good, uh, good morning, Your Worship. Uh, pleased to be here this morning, uh, representing uh, Waverly, Fall River, Musket, Albert Valley, and uh, just following the news, we unfortunately have had a tragic uh, death due to a dog attack uh, a little while ago. So uh, uh, our thoughts are with uh, with the family and their relatives at this time. Thank you. Absolutely, That's awful. Councillor Hensby. Muted, David. Oh, try that again. Yeah. Hello again, there, Mr. Mayor and Council. I just want to make sure that everything is a okay. I'm being sound, heard loud and clear with this microphone I'm using. So, see how it works. Thank you very much, and look forward to the debate today. We got you, sir. Councillor Karsten. Good morning, Mr. Mayor and colleagues and Council. Good to be with you this morning. I do have, uh, and it's unfortunate news, uh, Councillor Stretch in your district this morning. Uh, however, I do have some good news, Mr. Mayor, for you and, and colleagues and uh, the listening audience, and that is that uh, I have an appointment for the haircut on the 17th. Okay. And we make sure that all the city's social media picks that up, and because uh, <laughs> uh, I think that there's a fair bit of concern about that. Councillor Nickel, are you with us? I am, Mr. Mayor. Good morning, everyone. Nice to see everyone. Um, and I don't have a hair appointment. Thank you. Good morning. Councillor Austin. I'm here, Mr. Bear. There you are. <laughs> it takes a few minutes, doesn't it, to switch the camera over? Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Mancini. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Good morning, colleagues. And good morning, everybody watching. Um, I'm here from beautiful Dartmouth. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mason. There we go. I think you can hear me now. Yep. And see me. Uh, hi uh, from beautiful District 7. Uh, lots of people out working on their houses, mowing their lawns and stuff. So uh, forgive me if the noise comes through the open window. Thank you. Councillor Smith, are you with us? I'm with you and accounted for in the beautiful area in District of the Eight. Happy to be here, look forward to discussion today. Thank you. Councillor Clary. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, greetings from District 9, Halifax West Armdale. Um, I wanted to echo Councillor Stretch's uh, sadness at that unfortunate incident. Um, and um, I also wanna thank all those people who have been uh, demonstrating against anti-black racism, who have been emailing us, calling us, looking for real structural change uh, in the way we protect uh, our residents. Thank you, sir. Councillor Walker. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I had my hair cut on uh, Friday. All right. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Councillor Adams. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, my camera is uh, it's reversed, so I'm just waiting for a little uh, help. But um, I think if uh, I get a haircut, it's going to take about four hours because there's an awful lot of it lately. <laughs> you haven't pulled it out. <laughs> Councillor Zorowski. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and welcome from District 12. And um, condolences to the tragic loss of uh, life due to the dog attack. Now, as far as uh, Councillor Russell and Councillor Karsten goes, <laughs> I'm, I'm, if, if you do need a trimming, I'd be happy. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, <laughs> Thank I you. thought we were talking budget cuts. Oh, that too. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Whitman, are you with us? Good morning, Mayor Savage. Good morning, colleagues. I'm here. I'm actually on the fourth floor at City Hall, and I might run uh, 
down the hall and try to help uh, Councillor Adams, but stay six feet apart from him. Thank you. Councillor <laughs> Deputy Mayor. Good morning, everybody from beautiful downtown Beaver Bank. Uh, just uh, wanted to say good morning to everybody and looking forward to uh, the uh, debate and conversation as we continue our budget discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Russell. Good morning, everybody, and welcome from uh, wonderful Lower Sackville. Um, like Councillor Walker, uh, as all of the great Russells do, I had my hair cut at uh, 9 a.m. on Friday morning. My barber got in touch and said, yeah, you really need some help. So it was great to uh, heed that advice, and uh, and here we are looking forward to a good day. It took five minutes. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Outfit. Uh, good morning from uh, District 16, all here and ready to go. And it just amazes me that the guys with almost no hair get preferential treatment at the barbers. But anyway, those of us who need hours of work can't get in. But anyway, listen, uh, looking forward to this uh, important day today. And uh, it's a big one. also sending out best wishes. As some of you may have heard, there was a, an accident on the Bedford Highway last evening where two pedestrians were hit in a crosswalk. Obviously, I'm sending them our best wishes for a speedy recovery and also uh, committing that this council will continue to work to make our crosswalks and our streets safer. We've made a lot of progress, but there's still much to do. Best wishes to all. Thank you uh, for sharing those best wishes. And I know we all uh, are greatly concerned about what we're hearing coming out of Stephen Stretch's uh, area, uh, Councillor Stretch, and uh, wish the very best to all that are involved in that circumstance. Thank you, sir. Colleagues, today we're going to look at our budget, but before we do that, I'm, I'm going to um, use what I would call the mayor's prerogative. I want to make a short statement uh, further to what Councillor Cleary said about anti-black racism, and I ask your indulgence. Anti-black racism includes policies and practices embedded in our institutions that reflect and reinforce beliefs, attitudes, prejudice, stereotyping, and discrimination. It's directed at people of African descent, and it is rooted in their unique history of enslavement and colonization. To members of our African Nova Scotian community, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. For you, anti-black racism is not a definition, it is a lived experience. Racism has been cast into an especially bright public light in recent weeks. The horrific killing of George Floyd by a police officer in Minneapolis has ignited a massive protest movement around the world. Among the many sad facts of his death is that its shocking brutality did not come as a surprise. After all, George Floyd's name joins a litany of black lives lost. This time it was captured on camera, clear to all who could bear to watch. George Floyd was murdered in broad daylight. Last Monday, thousands of Halifax residents of all ages and backgrounds and experiences took a knee on Spring Garden Road for eight minutes and 46 seconds, the amount of time that George Floyd lay on the asphalt, begging for breath, with a police officer's knee pressed firmly on his neck. I was there that evening, as were many of you in solidarity with community members and particularly African Nova Scotians. I heard the voices of a growing chorus of allies in the fight against racism and lives lost at the hands of police and others. Floyd's death feels like a tipping point. Everywhere there is a feeling that this time must be different. From Minneapolis to other cities across the US and around the world, to Canada and here in Halifax, it is well past time for change. We will be judged, and I believe we will ultimately come to judge ourselves on our actions. Because our city and our province have our own history of systemic racism, including anti-black racism. Race has played a key role in the development of our communities, where people can live, what opportunities and services they are offered, where children have been allowed to go to school, and how police have managed our streets. We have a responsibility to own this history, to acknowledge it, and the hurt and the injustice that it has caused. The responsibility to change it rests with us individually and collectively. There is a time for protest and for listening, 
and there is a time for leadership and action. Our city has taken positive steps. I'm grateful for the work done by Tracy Jones Grant and her team in the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, which includes the African Nova Scotian Affairs Integration Office, which was established as part of the Africville settlement a decade ago. As well, our Public Safety Office, which you know is no longer housed inside Halifax Regional Police, has been critical to implementing a safety strategy that relies on a broad approach to building strong, resilient, caring communities for all. I'm proud that Chief Dan Kinsella apologized to the community when Dr. Scott Wortley's work made it abundantly clear that African Nova Scotians were inappropriately targeted for street checks. I'm pleased that these practices were ordered stopped and that the chief is leading the response work through an action plan. I'm grateful to see a strong diversity on the Board of Police Commissioners, the Civilian Oversight Authority for Policing in Halifax. So these are signs of progress. But thousands of people would not have gathered on Spring Garden Road or Grand Parade or Africville in recent days if it were enough. We're left to ask ourselves, how else can we make a difference? I believe through the Police Commission, we need to see sustained progress on the Wortley Report recommendations of last year. And I know from speaking with a number of you that are on the Board of Police Commissioners that you share that view. Police force leadership have worked hard to build one of the most diverse police forces in Canada. This work must continue, and we need to see a broad section of our community, including more African Nova Scotians within the force's highest ranks. Issues such as body police cameras and the purchase of an armored police vehicle need to be fully considered and reconsidered. And we must ask, are they needed? Will they help or harm? Are they in the broad public interest? And are they reasonable expenditure or the, over other areas of need? We as councillors will consider issues today and in the days ahead. And I trust that everybody around this virtual chamber will do so with care and compassion and good oversight. You know, it's been said, don't tell me your vision, show me your budget. While money is not the key measure of success, this municipality must commit to appropriately resourcing the additional work that is needed to force real change. In diversity and inclusion, public safety, youth programming, library services, hiring systems, procurement, planning and development, the work of this city should strengthen the fabric of communities and help more people find opportunities. Even as we deal with the financial impacts of COVID, these programs must be reinforced and strengthened. As we endorse the social lens on our council decisions, now is the time in my view to look at major projects to ensure we're including the voices and the skills of communities that are underrepresented. Major projects should highlight the African Nova Scotian history and culture for sure, but they should also create economic opportunity for black people through comprehensive community benefits programs. Many of us may think that we know more than we actually do about the experience of African Nova Scotians. Around our chamber, there is only one of us who really does. I think we all need to work to ensure that we have more diverse political representation in the future. I've spoken with our CAO Jacques Dubé, and I've asked for a public council presentation on anti-black racism in Halifax and Nova Scotia. I believe that will help set an appropriate context as we work to make our shared future better than our imperfect past. Colleagues, as we deal with the dual crises of COVID and climate change, we must also reflect deeply and res resolve to actively fight the blight of racism. Our critical eye will certainly look to the South and around the world, but our gaze must first focus on racial inequality injustice and racism here at home. Thank you for allowing me a few minutes to say that. I appreciate that. With that, colleagues, we will move back to uh, our agenda. There's no minutes to approve. We're going to move to the proposed 2021 budget and business plan, which, as you know, uh, we spent a lot of time proposing a budget that would have been approved in March. It's been recast and then it was bought to council and council deliberated and made further changes. 
Um, and so I think we have a presentation. Jacques uh, Dubé, our uh, CEO. Mayor, yes. Mayor, sorry to interrupt. It's uh, it's it's Tim. Uh, I'd like to move that we go in camera uh, for the purpose of receiving legal advice. Uh, great segue, your comments on to us needing to go in camera for legal advice on both the police budget and the possible procurement of the uh, of the armored vehicle. Yeah, I think uh, I agree with that. I just wonder if maybe we should have the presentation overall on the budget and then go in camera, Councillor. I, that's that's fine. Yes, I okay. just didn't want to miss the opportunity to just make sure that come, I did uh, not spoil. Yeah, I'll that's come. Fine. To Thank you. I'll come to you right after we've had the overall uh, presentation. If everybody's okay with that. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Jacques, are you uh, you and Jane? I'll leave it to you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of Regional Council. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that, uh, you know, as our province and municipality enter the reopening phase and life is starting to feel like it's finally getting back to some sense of normalcy, it can be easy to forget just how difficult these past few months have been for everyone. And when the COVID-19 outbreak began, our municipality took swift action to close our offices recreation centers, libraries, and drastically scaled back our transit services, all to keep our, our staff and our residents safe. You know, we lifted parking fees and fines to support our healthcare workers, and we postponed the due date for property taxes to provide some relief for struggling residents and business owners. We also had to make the very hard decision to lay off many of our seasonal workers as their service areas were no longer able to function due to public health restrictions. So this global, health, this global health crisis has been like nothing any of us have ever experienced. It's been hard on everyone. But we all work together to follow public health orders. And as the number of active cases in our, provinces, in our province continues to decline, we should all be very pleased of our collective effort. I do want to thank everyone on the front lines, healthcare workers, police and fire personnel, Halifax transit personnel, private sector em employees and employers, and many others who have contributed to keeping us all safe. And of course, we wish our Dalhousie University scientists and researchers much success in terms of identifying a vaccine for COVID-19. I'm also very proud of the way our HRM team has conducted itself during this time, and I'm confident that our actions and service level adjustments have also played a significant role in flattening the curve. As mentioned many times in previous weeks, these service level adjustments have come at a financial cost. While it is an unavoidable cost and one we could not reasonably predict, it has left us in a position to make difficult recommendations to regional council regarding our 2021 budget. While some large scale projects such as Cogswell district redevelopment and the conventional bus replacement have been delayed, the impact of COVID-19 has made way for some new projects and services to promote economic recovery and healthy lifestyles at a time when each is much needed. Our mobility response plan has widened sidewalks and implemented slow streets to allow residents to safely move through their communities while maintaining a physical distance. This project has been met with very positive responses from the community. And of course, Parks and Recreation has already started adding, adding virtual programs and activities on our website to provide residents with a variety of ways to stay active and have fun. And yes, we need to have fun even during this challenge, these challenging times. We've also managed to maintain funding for some important uh, initiatives of regional council, such as Halifax 2050, upgrades to the aquatic facilities at the Halifax Common, and we're moving forward with, Woods with the Woodside Ferry Terminal upgrades to provide an enhanced quality of travel to commuters. Mr. Mayor, these projects lead back to the core vision of the municipality, enhancing our quality of life by fostering the growth of healthy and vibrant communities, a strong and diverse economy, and a sustainable environment. I certainly agree with you that actions, uh, our actions mean more than the words of our vision at, at this present time, and this budget reflects that. Before I present a detailed overview of our 2021 recommended budget, I would like to remind everyone that while this is not the budget we had hoped for at the beginning of the year, 
Our municipality remains in a relatively good position due to our history and fiscal responsibility. You know, the fiscal discipline demonstrated by the mayor, regional council and the staff over the past number of years, along with record setting economic growth has placed our organization in a much better position than many municipalities in our province and in fact, our country. That said, it will take some time to get back to where we were, but we will get there together. With this budget, we have continued to make fiscally responsible recommendations focused on long-term sustainability and growth that will continue to make our municipality a desirable destination to work, to live, to visit, raise a family and start a business. So Mr. Mayor and members of Regional Council, we've been discussing the budget for a number of weeks in May, and I thought it would be helpful to summarize all of those conversations into our presentation. I want to thank you for your participation and your guidance throughout the process. We have what I believe is a fiscally responsible budget and one that allows HRM to respond to the impacts of COVID-19 this budget year and beyond. I would also like to thank the directors and their teams for their work and of course, the outstanding finance budget team led by our very capable CFO, Jane Fraser. Frankly, preparing two budgets in one year is not something that any of us, any of us want to repeat anytime soon. But we got it done and here we are today to present what we think is the final budget recommendation to Council. So we go to the first slide on the current environment. When we were debating our pre-COVID budget in March, we were talking about how strong HRM's economy was and how we were positioned for strong growth and continued investment. At that time, the issue was the pace of growth we were seeing and the impact that growth would have on service delivery and resident expectations. Now, we are facing a global economic crisis that has not been, not been seen since the Great Depression as a result of a healthcare crisis, a pandemic worldwide. And as we all know, the hospitality industry, an industry in which we depend a lot for economic growth and employment in HRM and in Nova Scotia, it has been hit very hard. And how many will be able to come back is unknown at this time, especially if there's a second wave of COVID-19, as many are predicting, many experts in the healthcare, public healthcare space are predicting at this time. Municipalities across the country are experiencing the same things HRM is, revenue loss, liquidity issues, and finding new ways to deliver those services that can still be provided. Some municipalities are not as well positioned as HRM to come out of this. We will come out of this together with a refocus priorities and improved way of doing business. In the words of Rahm Emanuel, one should never waste a good crisis. Next slide, please. HRM's economic forecast shows where we are, we where we were in March pre-COVID and today. GDP is expected to decline by almost six percent compared to growing by 1.8 percent in March. Labor income growth is dropping by 6.2 percent, with recovery anticipated to start in 21-22. Inflation is declining with modest growth in dwelling units. Next slide, please. With the uncertainty of how deep or how long the impact of COVID-19 will be, many industry advisors, economists, and academics are trying to quantify the impact on the economy and the longer term outlook. When you look at the economic indicators, we're seeing predictions of unemployment being re remaining high, at, very high at 12%. There's a risk of deflation. The housing market is predicted to soften. Yet the real estate industry is presently seeing in HRM housing prices remaining at current levels. A decrease in sales will impact HRM's deed transfer tax revenue. We should see strong public investment in infrastructure, assuming the municipal, federal and provincial governments can agree on stimulus, stimulus funding and other infrastructure project funding. But there is uncertainty about private sector investment and what that what that and what the longer term impact will be on all growth and renewal projects going forward, whether private or public. And of course, falling interest rates impacts our investment income. In relation to taxes outstanding, we continue to see property tax payments coming in and the total interim tax bill was $379.3 million. Commercial payments are stronger than expected. 
For example, the hotel industry has paid 72% of the taxes owing on the June billing, but it's very unlikely we'll see this level of payment in the final bill in October. What is surprising is the residential amount outstanding as we have not seen much growth there since the 1st of June. The amount of unpaid taxes for the interim bill is likely to level out around $40 million or 11.4% outstanding. Typically, the amount of uncollected taxes at by this point under normal circumstances is in the 2 to 3% range as opposed to the 11.4% that we're expecting to see in this latest billing. That said, the October tax bill will likely have a higher percentage of uncollectible taxes as the impact of COVID-19 ripples through the economy and a second COVID wave materializes as predicted by public health experts. We have updated the HRM webpage to make people aware that we can set people and businesses up for a tax payment plan for those that were not able to pay their taxes on June 1st. They simply need to contact the Revenue Division as noted on our webpage. Now I'd like to speak, Mr. Mayor, about the fiscal approach and the financial aspects of the budget. So as I said in my opening remarks, we are recommending a budget that is prudent and allows for fiscal sustainability in the long term. We have been able to maintain our reserve balances to give us flexibility to address emerging pressures and to take advantage of cost shared infrastructure programs. The capital plan is still very healthy at $208 million, which supports regional council's commitment to keeping the economy going. We are keeping our long-term debt low. We will have to take out short-term debt to ensure liquidity. However, that does not impact our debt service ratio. And we have built in a contingency, a, a contingency to protect against further economic impacts of COVID-19 and to allow us to reopen and enhance municipal services as restrictions are lifted. As Jane and I have said throughout the budget debates, it is next year and 2022-23 that are going to be the more challenging years. This recommended budget positions council to have some options to address those challenges and hopefully avoid raising taxes going forward through the pandemic recovery period. In relation to operating capital budgets, Mr. Mayor, I'm now going to go through the operating and capital changes that have been made to the budget. A number of the slides compared the March 24th budget to this recommended recast budget. So in relation to operating revenue in 2021, this slide shows the dollar amount and the percentage of revenue source. And the next slide compares the revenue sources in a table format, which is a little easier to read. The total budget for 2021 is now $955.3 million, and this is a reduction of $45 million from the $1 billion budget that would have been presented in March. In relation to revenue by category, this table clearly illustrates where the revenue drops are, or are occurring. And I've highlighted the two largest drops, the deed transfer tax and transit fares. Those two revenue streams account for a $29.7 million drop. You'll notice in the budget report that the revenue for deed transfer tax has been revised downwards by a further 2.5 million to a $10 million decrease on the March budget. Housing sales in May were very slow and there is, an, there is uncertainty in sales volumes going forward. This reduction was offset by a decrease in the evaluation allowance for uncollectible taxes. The commercial tax payments were stronger than anticipated and were comfortable taking some risk on the evaluation. The dollar change in the comparison of the 1920 budget numbers to the June 19th, uh, June 9th budget numbers uh, are, uh, are, are shown as well. Next slide on operating expenditures. These are the expense, expenses for each business unit. I should point out that the budgets for the business units listed as a schedule to the report are net of revenues. Total municipal expenditures are $787.1 million, a decrease of $45 million. I do want to mention that the provincial mandatory contribution has not changed since, March, since the March 24th budget. At that time, it was a $6 million increase over 1920, and the Department of Education is seeking that amount, notwithstanding the pandemic has closed schools. Provincial mandatory contributions now account for 17.6% of this budget. It was 16.2% of the March 24th budget. And the reason for that, of course, is that we had a higher budget at $1 billion in March. I do want to point out, Mr. Mayor, that should Regional Council approve this budget, we will pay at a 75% level the mandatory contributions. 
It is our understanding, and that is immediately, it is our understanding that all provincial departments, including education, have been asked by the Minister of Finance to find savings in which schools haven't been closed for a few months. We have questioned why the original amount is being requested as it stands to reason that mandatory contributions should be part of that, of those savings, of those savings exploration by the Minister of Finance. We'll keep you informed, Regional Council and Mr. Mayor, of any adjustments that may be forthcoming based on discussions with the province of Nova Scotia. The next slide is speaks to spending by category. And similar to the revenue slide, this table compares the March 24th budget with the budget that is before you today. The dollar change is the comparison of the 1920 budget to the restated budget. The biggest change is, the, in, is in compensation through the vacancy management measures and term and casual layoffs that were put in place. Compensation is our largest expense, and in order to reduce the budget in a meaningful way, we had to take significant action. And I know these are tough decisions to make, and it places pressure on our staff and our ability to deliver services, but it was a necessary decision we had to make. Under fiscal services, the large change there is mainly the result of reducing capital from operating by 25 million through the capital budget process and other expenses have increased since March by $2 million. I'd like to speak now about infrastructure investment comparisons from March 24th to June 9th. As part of the budget exercise, we looked at the capital plan to see if savings could be realized by updating project assumptions with new manufacturing and workplace impacts from COVID-19, we adjusted expectations for budget requirements and scheduling. The result of that exercise was a reduction in the work plan of over $100 million, leaving a total capital spend, carryover and budget of $208 million for 2021, which is still a significant investment. Roads has the largest reduction, which is mainly related to the Cogswell interchange, pushing that out a year. That said, I do want to assure Council that we intend to bring a positive recommendation forward mid-summer that would, if adopted, trigger the tender call to allow Codswell to commence construction late winter, early spring of 2021. The investment in infrastructure for 2021 reflects prioritized work to continue without pause in all areas of the business, to provide stability in service delivery to the community with a more accurate representation of the ability to, to deliver. In relation to investment in capital, the key focus for 2021 capital plan of responsible investment and steady growth has been maintained throughout the recast plan. We sustain council's direction to invest a minimum of 70% annually in maintaining the condition of our existing assets for service resilience and its long-term goal to minimize the total cost of ownership. We have increased the ratio of renewal versus growth in the recast budget. Key investments in the budget continue to be prioritized by council in response to the citizen survey and community feedback and include improving the design, connection and condition of Halifax's transportation network and increasing our impact and level of stewardship for the environment. Now, Mr. Mayor, I would like to move on to debt, reserves and taxes, which are the foundation of fiscal sustainability. In relation to taxable and short-term debt, uh, as you can see, the tax see the as you can see, taxable debt or debt related to capital continues to fall. You'll recall that as part of the March budget, Council approved the, the use of a portion of the 1920 surplus to be used to fund capital rather than increase the debt. The green bar you see is the impact of the anticipated short-term borrowing requirement. We will be proposing later this month to, to borrow $130 million from the province. The budget assumes that, that the terms will be three years at 1.1%. The annual principal and interest payment would be $44 million. There are very encouraging conversations ongoing with the province that may extend the term of the loan to five years with a 1.4% interest rate. If that occurs, the annual payment will fall to $27 million annually. <clears throat> Next, I'd like to speak to reserves being an important tool going forward. Of course, our reserves continue, continue to remain steady. This budget is approved as recommended. The protected balance as at March 31st, 2021 is anticipated to be $207 million. The four year schedule in the staff report represents the balances before the budget is approved. That is the reason for the difference in the ending balance. This total includes the recommended six month payment of, short -term, of the short-term loan, which is $22 million. 
We're also recommending that 12.8 million that are normally that is normally deposited in the strategic capital reserves be deposited in the capital reserve, which would allow HRM to take advantage of anticipated cost shared infrastructure programs with the provincial and federal governments. Next, I'd like to speak to net reserve balances by type of reserve after the budget commitments. So this is this is a historic view of reserves by the three categories. A large increase in the obligation reserves, the blue bar in 2021 is mainly the six month short term loan payment. The projected reserve balance for 2021 is $207 million, which seemed like a lot of money pre COVID. But we spend at the rate of between 85 and $100 million a month. The reserves are projected to be 125.7 million in 23, 24, and that is a decrease of 40%. The forecasted reserve balances are based on projected capital commitments and other commitments such as the Halifax Convention Center, principal and interest payments and landfill closures. Council has some flexibility can always consider reversing some commitments. We also budget for deposits in reserve as well. A number of business cases have required budgeted deposits like the gas tax must be in a reserve and the, and the sale of assets must go in, in a capital reserve as per the charter. I know a lot of people are asking, why aren't we using reserves instead of borrowing? The reality is we do not know what October is going to look like from a revenue point of view in 21-22 and 22-23 are huge question marks at this time and no doubt will be more challenging than the current fiscal year due to a drop in commercial tax base. It is highly plausible that we will have to use some of this reserve money in the future to fund operations. We cannot continue to borrow for short term purposes, even at a very low interest rate, because paying back the loan puts pressure on the tax rate and service levels you wish to maintain. In relation to the 2021 average residential taxes, as I stated when we started this round of budget committee meetings, we would not be at would we not be recommending a tax bill increase beyond that of 1.4%, which was recommended in March. And we have effectively achieved that with this budget recommendation. And it's frankly an incredible piece of work to, to come back to council with a with a tax rate or tax bill increase of no more than 1.4% after having to have to absorb all of the changes to the budget, you know, to the tune of $44 million in tax and, and short term loan payments, etc. So it's an incredible effort by the team to be able to come up with that achievement. The increase on the residential side is all assessment growth. Tax rate has not changed. The impact on the average tax bill is recommended to be $27. It is a different story on the commercial side where the assessment growth was only 1%. So the commercial rate has increased by 0.4%, but the impact on the average bill is $585, which is still 1.4% on the average commercial tax bill. So we've been able to achieve 1.4% on both sides, commercial and residential. With the economic uncertainty, it was felt that now was not the time for an additional increase. And we looked at our own services and expenditures to address the budget short shortfall. And I'm so thankful to, to Jane and her team and all the directors and their respective teams for landing a budget that achieves that. I expect that the 21-22 budget will be a different picture as will 22-23 given commercial assessments will be lower given commercial margins will be even lower for businesses. Flat or falling commercial tax revenue will put pressure on the tax rates, which we will, we'll, we will need to mitigate through a combination of further restraints on spending and the use of reserves in those years. Over the fall, staff will be looking at taxation options and working with PBSC to understand the impact on commercial tax revenue for 21-22 and beyond. Next, I'd like to speak to the financial strategy for resilience. As I said at the outset, this proposed budget is one that is prudent and fiscally responsible. We have built in resiliency for the future by trimming expenditures, securing a short term loan to preserve liquidity, budgeting for six month principal and interest payment in this budget to relieve pressure on 21-22. We have assisted businesses and residents as much as we are legally able to do by extending the interim tax bill due date to June 1st and to give taxpayers more time to pay and we reduce the interest rate on outstanding amount from 15% to 10% at a cost of almost $2 million to the municipality. And as I mentioned earlier in my comments, we're certainly willing, more than willing and prepared to set up payment plans for those who cannot pay on time. 
Mr. Mayor, we have not gone to reserves to pay for services. We continue to have healthy balances that give patron flexibility and allow us to take advantage of cost sharing opportunities with the province and federal government as they arise and to have a cash source for 21-22 and 22-23 if needed. And we built in a contingency of over $12 million to offset budget shortfalls or to allow us to provide more services or enhanced services as restrictions are relaxed. You know, for example, as you know, there have been decisions since the pandemic and since, and, and even as we were preparing the recast budget, the reopen parks and trails and, and uh, you know, community centers at a certain level, those kinds of things. So we've been, we've been adjusting and we're gonna need to use the contingency to continue to adjust. Just this week, I had a conversation with Brad Angus at TPW, and you know we are facing pressure there as we're as the economy is reopening. So we're going to have to bring people back, likely to to uh, to make sure that we can meet expectations and meet service levels. So that contingency of twelve million dollars is extremely important to allow us to actually respond to the reopening of the economy and, and pressures on, on 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 the actual service delivery itself. You know, Mr. Mayor, a budget is simply a plan plan that shows you where you will be spending your money and investing. And what we have done is laid out a plan that the CFO and I believe will position us to remain stable for the balance of this year and into 21-22. We will monitor the plan throughout the year and we will adjust accordingly. And with that, Mr. Mayor and Councillors, I will, I will conclude this presentation by thanking you for your patience and your interest. As a team, we are looking forward to your questions and budget decisions. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Waleliak. Thank you, uh, Jacques, very much. So, um, colleagues, Councillor uh, Outfit was uh, going to move that we go in camera. We can consider that now, Councillor Outfit, if uh, if you wish. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And thank you, Jacques, for the presentation. And, and Mayor, thank you for your uh, tremendous comments at the beginning of this session with my full support. Uh, I want to move in camera for the purpose of receiving uh, some legal advice from the solicitor. And I want to make it clear to those listening that does not mean the budget will be debated in camera. It does not mean the police budget will be debated in camera. It means that we need to receive some legal advice that cannot be given publicly. And when I tried to get this uh, advice by email to councillors, that was also determined that was something we could not do uh, because it would have to be done in camera when you receive uh, advice from your lawyers. So uh, that is why I'd like us to go briefly in camera to receive some uh, legal advice from Mr. Trips. I can see any seconds that. Seconded by Mancini. Just before we vote on that, colleagues. Uh, uh, nope, we're good. Okay. So um, it's been moved that we go in in camera. I think we can just turn our mic, turn our microphones on, uh, or or wave. All in favor? Aye. 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 Hello. Aye. Aye. Okay. Anybody opposed? We'll uh, we'll move in camera, colleagues, and I think that's set up, uh, Laura, on our on our uh, calendars. Uh, yes, it is, Mr. Mayor. Everyone should uh, have that in their calendars. Who's been invited to in camera? Okay. So we're going to hang up here, folks, and come back on the other meeting in camera. Everybody clear? Crystal. Okay.
Is there anybody out there? There you guys are. Come here. Bruce, you look really comfy. <laughs> no mosquitoes outside. So a reminder to all that we are still live. So please uh, keep your audio uh, muted until we resume the meeting. We have a couple of folks that look like they're trying to uh, to get in. Councillor Whitman, are you in? Councillor Zarowski? Okay, let's, um, Laura, do, are we still missing a couple of co uh, councillors? Uh, we are just missing uh, Councillor Zarowski. Okay. Corey, you're working on Richard? Okay. All right, colleagues, then let's, um, Laura, we're back in public session, right? Uh, correct, Mr. Mayor, you are live. Okay, all right. Um, council. What is your wish? We have, uh, does somebody want to put the um, the motion on the floor and then we can start our discussion? I can do that, sir. Thank you, go ahead. All right. Uh, I move that the budget committee amend the main motion directing the chief administrative officer to revise the 2020-21 proposed operating and capital budgets as voted on by Regional Council's Committee of the Whole on Budget at their February 12, 2020 meeting, using the revisions proposed in the staff report dated May 30, 2020, as summarized in Tables 1, 2, and 3, supported by Attachments C and D, as previously amended through the budget process, to further direct the Chief Administrative Officer to 1, forgo the planned $12 million contribution to the Strategic Capital Reserve Q606 for fiscal 2020-21 and redirect this amount to the Capital Reserve Q526 to be used to cost share, the, uh, cost share in infrastructure programs that may be established by federal and or provincial governments in response to COVID-19. Two, utilize $12.6 million in fiscal services to enhance municipal services that have been reduced due to COVID-19 and not currently budgeted for and or to address adverse economic conditions as a result of COVID-19. And that the Budget Committee recommend that Halifax Regional Council adopt the revised resolution for approval of operating and capital budgets and tax rates for fiscal 2020-21 as set out in Schedule 1 of the staff report dated May 30th, 2020. I so move. Second. Second, Councillor Nickel. All right. Okay. Motion is on the floor. Ready for the question? Councillor Cleary. Oh, I have a question, sir. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, well, what well, use use the chat, folks. Yeah. Use, the, use the chat line. Um, if because uh, no one was putting in the chat that they wanted to speak, so uh, I do want to uh, move a motion uh, to amend. But um, if people have general questions on the budget, uh, I'd be happy to see the floor to them for now, uh, and then come back with that motion so I don't uh, discourage that kind of questioning on the main motion. 
Yeah, well, there's no, as you said, there's nobody in the chat line. Um, I'm typing it, sir. Is it a question of clarification or? It's a, an amendment to the budget, please. I'll just, I'll just hit this here or and I'll okay. press the send button. I'll, uh, seeing, no, seeing no questions of clarification, I'm going to go back to uh, Councillor Cleary. OK, oh. thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. So uh, and I will put my motion uh, in the chat. I'll copy and paste it here and it may need to be cleaned up a little. But the motion uh, reads um, in two parts. Bring up my window here. Uh, I move that the Committee of the Whole on Budget cancel the order for the armored rescue vehicle, the approximately 368,000, use these funds to restore the following cuts from the recast 2020-2021 uh, budget. Um, and I would obviously need some wording on the uh, canceling of the armored rescue vehicle from our solicitor and from our CFO because it's a complicated matter as it was in the 19-20 uh, budget. But in order to uh, use those funds uh, that, are that were canceling with the ARV, I'd like those funds to be specifically directed into uh, two places and then the remainder in somewhere else. So 53,500 in programming dollars for the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, which had actually been cut from the recast budget. $25,000 for special projects and $11,000 to support business units to advance public safety strategy actions from the Public Safety Office and then use the remainder uh, of the funds to support anti-black racism efforts and initiatives. Uh, so uh, that's on the floor if anyone wants to second, second it. And then second, I'll second Whitman. Councillor Whitman had signaled in the chat that he wanted to second that. I, think yeah. I put that before him actually. No, yeah. you didn't actually. I'll, I'll let the record reflect uh, which, whichever, but uh, thank you, Councillor Smith. Uh, so um, in terms of the uh, motion, I've, I've said it, but I will put it in the chat and it may need to be cleaned up uh, and I'll let our solicitor and CFO uh, take that on if uh, they need to. So, uh, so it's um, Mr. Mayor, if I may. Please. I, I would suggest that um, the main motion essentially needs to be amended to rescind um, Council's decision to reserve fund the armored vehicle um, from uh, from uh, 19 or sorry 2019 to 2020 and then direct the money as the councillor has indicated. Um, it's a CAO awarded contract. Um, council's council's decision here is around funding. So if it is a desire of council, then we need to rescind the uh, the earlier decision to uh, to reserve fund the armored vehicle. OK, so does that uh, do we need to get the language right now? I, I, I think it would be helpful for the clerk uh, if we had the wording. Um, it's simply a matter of changing the, the opening portion. To indicate that council that the main motion be amended to rescind council's decision to reserve fund the armored vehicle. OK, so let's have conversation on it. Um, Jane, did you want to? I see you. You're interested in speaking to this. I am. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So the um, the funding for the vehicle came out of the uh, QF uh, Q531 uh, fleet vehicle and equipment. So typically what happens is that the funding would go back into that reserve. The business case is fairly specific about what the uh, what the funding can be used for. Uh, so I think uh, in order to achieve the other part of uh, Councillor Cleary's motion, we would have to identify a different uh, funding source for that. Madam Clerk, you get that? Okay, what do we need to do to have the conversation, uh, Cheryl? Do we, uh, are you going to work on that while we have a conversation? Uh, yeah. Okay. All right, then let's, uh, Councillor Clear, are you okay for now? Well, I just, if I could just say a, a few brief words, and I think your words at the very beginning of the meeting um, reflected uh, uh, 
a lot of thoughts that a lot of people are having about this. And I do want to make it clear to people that, um, you know, depending on what happens during the rest of the debate on budget, uh, we are all thinking about what we can do to protect our, our citizens better, uh, how we can root out systemic and structural uh, bias in our systems, how we can um, create our systems so that they are more inclusive and not exclusive. And that's going to take uh, a long-term effort, uh, but it's important that we start now. And this is one of the things that we could do to start now. Uh, another thing that I talked to a number of counselors about, uh, and that is to you know, look at setting up very quickly a process to start thinking about uh, alternatives to policing services and a lot of the actions that police now engage in, uh, whether it's mental health, whether it's uh, community building, all of those things. But anyway, I'll save those for another time. But this armored vehicle, in my mind, is all part of the same package of the initiatives that we can start taking today uh, to make life better, especially if you happen to be a black Haligonian. So thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so we're on the uh, the motion of Councillor Cleary. Councillor Hensby will come to you after we deal with this uh, amendment. Is that all right? OK. Um, Councillor Smith. Am I good? Yeah, you're good. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so I support this 100% in, in there's there's many reasons why. And uh, I want to first acknowledge uh, everybody who, who has been using their voice, no matter where they, they come from, to express their feelings towards the issues that we're facing today. But, you know, more importantly, the folks that are on the front lines who are working very hard to not see us go back to business as usual. And, you know, the mayor acknowledged in his opening remarks that it's, it's pretty obvious when you look around the table and the demographics of our council that I am the only one uh, of, of color. And uh, unfortunately, when we're talking about these experiences that we're facing today, um, some of us might have experience of, of how things might face us, but when we're talking about police brutality and racism and systemic racism and discrimination. Um, that is something that I've, I've faced for my entire life. So when we have people coming to us from all walks of life asking us to do things, whether it's defund or armored vehicle, um, uh, this is we're now seeing an influx of people from all walks of life saying we we see the pain. And, you know, I know many folks are feeling tired and feeling anxious and in in feeling uh, worried. Uh, I get it, but yeah, it sucks. That is the story of what many people of color face uh, on a daily basis. So, you know, a first step for us could be and should be one to to support this motion um, uh, and specifically around the armored vehicle. And uh, I will come back and speak later on the conversation around defunding. But I, I really hope that the, and you know, speaking to some of my colleagues this week, they understand that this is not just about um, safety of officers. This is also about safety of community, which that is should be a priority of, of council as well. And I also want the minutes to reflect that that I did second this motion. I put it in the chat to make sure that I was part of that. So thank you. Here, here. I appreciate that. Uh, in the chat, Councillor Whitman seconded it at one minute before you did, uh, Councillor. As well it's as one minute after, unfortunately. So, but he did uh, indicate at 11:54 that he wanted to second Cleary's motion. Um, so I think there's multiple people that would second this, and um, I got to follow the uh, the rules we have. Councillor Karsten. Uh, 
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. And certainly I will support the motion. Uh, I actually originally just uh, rang in to, uh, to raise Jane's uh, concern in terms of not potentially being able to spend the money that uh, Councillor Cleary was referring to uh, based on the, the funding from the Armored Rescue Vehicle, I think would, well, as Jane just said, would go back into that reserve. So that, that does need to uh, be clarified before we actually take the vote. You know, I, I guess um, uh, when it comes to this vehicle, uh, I want to be, if you will, living proof that change can happen. Uh, certainly when we got our first few emails on Thursday, I, I scratched my head. I followed obviously uh, with great concern uh, about the murder of uh, uh, Mr. Floyd in the States. Uh, didn't know how that would uh, transcend into uh, any tangible action in our municipality, but uh, certainly change does need to happen. Uh, and, and so this is a small step, but I think a very significant step. And quite frankly, uh, I'm giving this considerable amount of thought uh, as the emails kept rolling in, uh, I do, I do, see for me at least from my own personal experience similarities between uh, the decision I'm making to support this today and the decision I made on the Cornwallis statue and uh, I, I, I will frame it this way that uh, my mind goes back to that time uh, that people were saying well it's just a statue but what we all agreed or at least what I agreed to uh, and, and thus my vote is that if it made uh, those who were offended by the statue uh, feel uh, like it's a strong move to show our support and move the issue forward, then certainly I was going to be supportive. And that's how I view this armored uh, rescue vehicle. Uh, uh, certainly there's uh, things we need to take in consideration moving forward. Uh, the defund police uh some thoughts on that we'll get into that uh another time but uh this is uh as much and, and i don't want to use the word mr mayor symbolism uh because it is more than that but there's an element of it that does send a message that uh, uh an old fellow like me is willing to to listen uh and uh recognize where we can make change and i'm certainly willing to do that uh by my vote today uh, to to uh, cancel this particular uh, purchase. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Just a, a, a note to Laura or somebody. I, normally, I, the person who's speaking shows up on my screen at least. I, I'm not. That wasn't the case with Councilor Carston. I don't uh, know if it's the whole time. No. The reason uh, for that. So, Mr. Mayor, it could happen if the individual doesn't have their camera turned on. Okay. All right. Okay, so please make sure your camera's turned on when you're that, speaking. That was the case, Mr. Mayor, I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, not a problem. Secondly, um, in the chat line, it's been acknowledged that uh, I think that Councillor, yeah, Councillor Smith will second that. Councillor Whitman has acknowledged uh, that, so thank you both. Councillor Walker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And <clears throat> my question is on procedure. And can at a budget meeting, can you move a motion of rescission? Or does not at the end of this meeting, Councillor Cleary has to give a motion of rescission to cancel what we did last year? Mr. Traves? Mr. Mayor, through you to Council, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, it's actually good to remind uh, members of Council, the Budget Committee will ultimately be making a recommendation to Council and the recommendation to if if this uh, amendment passes would also include uh, a recommendation to defund um, the uh, the vehicle. Council will then ultimately decide. Where does the motion of reconsideration come in? It it would be it. Uh, <clears throat> The, the decision was done by this budget committee a recommendation originally, so it's a rescission of the earlier decision here, and it'll be a rescission at council as well. It'll require two thirds vote by council. Okay, thank you. Colleagues, I'm sorry, we're gonna, we're gonna take a break here. Uh, we have a, we're gonna come back right where we left off. So we'll just leave the list as it is with Councillor 
my list shows Adams, Mason, Blackburn, Outfit, Nickel, and uh, potentially uh, others. Um, and so I think the idea is that we will do committee of the whole on uh, budget before we move to our council uh, agenda, okay? okay? We're gonna come back at one o'clock. Thank you all.
Uh, Mr. Mayor? Yeah. 27 years today, the Habs have last won the cup, buddy. I remember it well. You trying to make me happy or sad? <laughs> I remember it well. I was doing a workshop in uh, in Sydney for Nova Scotia Power, and I'm in the hotel room. I didn't want to go down to the bar to watch the game. I'm in my hotel room, and they win it, and uh, I'm jumping up and down. Still live, Tony. Yeah, it's okay. It's all good stuff, though. Thank you. <laughs> so that was 27 years ago today. So you, it depends how you look at it, Mr. Mayor. You can be either sad or happy. Mm. You'll ponder that, will you? <laughs> My highlight as a Habs fan was the night that they beat the Quebec Nordiques on Good Friday in 1984. Remember it well. I think McPhee was part of that equation too. Mike McPhee, number 35. He didn't mind uh, mixing it up with those Nordiques either. Yeah. Never forgive Louis Slager. All right, we are live, but I'm uh, not ashamed of saying that. <laughs> Are we starting back at one o'clock? We are. Okay. Go. It's one thirty in Muscadabra. I'm not that far east. Laura, how are we doing in terms of people on, on the call? Uh, we do have quorum, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we are waiting for Councillors Austin and uh, just Councillor Austin to rejoin. Thank you. We'll just wait a sec. Hear the chimes from City Hall, Mike. I miss hearing those. Oh yeah. They seem to come on every time I'm doing an interview in Grand Parade. <laughs> Is the cannon back? The noon gun? It was supposed to be back. I didn't hear it today, though. Did you hear? Can I heard it? It's it's back. Is it? Oh, awesome. Yeah. And uh, Mr. Mayor, this is Laura. Uh, Councillor Austin has rejoined the meeting, so we can send you live if you'd like. All right. Are we at one? Yes. OK. OK, we're back. It's uh, Tuesday, June the 9th, 2021, uh, 2020. And uh, we are resuming with uh, Committee of the Whole on budget, and then we'll do uh, our council meeting, which should be five to eight minutes. So we will uh, continue with the, the budget. Jane, are you uh, are you on the call, Jane? Yes, I am, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Welcome back. I see you've Thank revised you. the uh, motion. Can you just speak to that perhaps a bit? Certainly, Mr. Mayor, through you to Council. So because the uh, vehicle was originally purchased out of the uh, fleet and equipment reserve, uh, the motion will have to be to put the funds back into that reserve, which is uh, Q531. 
the uh, uses of uh, funds in the reserve are very narrow per the business case. Um, if counselor, if council uh, wants to support Councillor Cleary's motion for the other items, I would recommend that funding <coughs> from the stable uh, contingency stabilization reserve Q421 be used to fund those. The amount of the armored vehicle uh, budget is five hundred thousand dollars. Thank you. OK, thank you, Jane. Everybody's clear on that. Um, so the list I have right now is Councillor Adams, Mason, Deputy Mayor, Outfit, Nicole, Hensby and Sorowski will pick up with uh, Councillor Adams. Uh, thank you, uh, Your Worship. Um, I, and I understand this is a very um, emotional time. It's a very sensitive time and rightfully so. Um, Mr. Floyd's death is uh, unconscionable and those individuals responsible, I hope that they get everything that's coming to them and then some. Um, I, I cannot, uh, and, and I don't link the, the two of these items, I cannot support the removal of this particular vehicle. Um, we've seen some incidents around the Maritimes and even in the uh, Parliament Hill where uh, these vehicles were used, especially the one up in Parliament Hill. Um, we had some emails and all the members of council were aware them. There were five or 600 of them. And I'll just read a quote out of one of them. It says, studies have shown that um, militarized police forces, including a provision of armored vehicles like this one, are highly linked to increases in violence against civilians at the hands of police. And I, I really am uh, struggling with that. Let's use something as an example. The RCMP, the local detachment in Halifax or Dartmouth, has uh, a vehicle at their disposal, and that, that vehicle is far larger than the one that we are considering here. Perhaps at some point in time, we could get some information from the RCMP or, or civilians as well as to how many people have been uh, harmed by that. And I dare say the answer is zero, but I'd like to get confirmation from the RCMP. Um, perhaps some, I'm not sure if Mr. Traves is able to answer this particular question, but uh, what is our responsibility as a, as a council with regard to ensuring our, our uh, members are safe? Is there a... Is there, is this linked to this or is this a, a separate entity or a separate issue? All employers, um, oh, sorry, Mr. Mayor, through you to the council, are all, all employers um, have an obligation on their occupational health and safety to provide safe working conditions for their employees. Councillor Adams? You're, you're muted, Councillor. You're muted. I can't hear you, Councillor Adams. OK, there we go. I'm not touching this anymore. This thing's got a delay of about 12 seconds. And I'm a little spazzy sometimes. So anyway, thanks for your, your patience here. Um, you know, and that's the angle I'm looking at here. That's the that's the, the 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 way I'm proceeding with this particular decision. I think that it, it, to ensure those 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 officers that put their lives on the line on a daily basis, they don't know what's coming next. They have no idea with this particular vehicle, which really is replacing an old. Uh, it looks like a, an old can power uh, van that's been fortified. Uh, that's what it'd be replacing from years ago. I can provide a picture later on for for members of council. So I'm simply looking at this as a, as a safety uh, issue. Um, again, uh, I'm, I'm separating the, the two issues with regard to uh, Mr. Floyd's um, uh, a terrible tragedy and uh, protecting our, our officers, which you know, with this, uh, they can also be used to uh, protect the uh, residents as well. But thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You know, I think we're lucky uh, that we live in a city that uh, uh, where our senior police leadership going back, I think it was Chief McKinnon, uh, I remember early after amalgamation was asked by someone on council. Uh, so what would you do if we gave you another half a million bucks? 
And his response was, don't give me a half million bucks. You should put that into recreation in low income communities. Right. And last, uh, our last chief police, uh, Chief Blay, uh, talked openly and repeatedly about how uh, it, you know, more appropriate ways of responding to community uh, safety issues and mental health issues could be to send unarmed responders who are trained in those issues rather than tying down uh, expensive, highly trained. Uh, police who are armed with with weapons. And uh, so so we've been having these discussions, I feel, for 15, 15 years at least in Halifax. Uh, and then you add on top of that uh, the Wortley report and the Claremont report. And then you add on top of that what we see in the United States since George Floyd was murdered by police officers in Minneapolis. Uh, and uh, the response of some police forces to use tools like like the ARV were proposed to buy to uh, act against people who are lawfully protesting in many cases, not in every case, but in many cases. And and for me, I'm I'm changing my mind. I've been quite open to my residents. I, I voted for it. And now I'm going to vote to to not buy it. And the reason why I've changed my mind is not money and it's not because of 800 emails. I, I changed my mind watching that video, watching those reports of what is happening on the streets in the United States. And I think it's probably remote. There's a remote chance you would ever see that vehicle used like that in Halifax or Nova Scotia to suppress people lawfully protesting. But I think it's more likely that you would have a circumstance where it might be used that way than it would be used to recover people or to advance on on uh, on uh, one of these uh, active shooter incidents that we're talking about. Uh, and, and, and I do feel that there are other less, frankly, threatening tools that we can buy that can achieve that as far as the ballistic shooter, the ballistic weapons incidents go. Uh, as, as we discussed, you know, so maybe the Canpar van's no good anymore, but we can buy an up armored van. We can get a suburban like the president drives in. Yeah. Those are discussions we need to have. And so I feel right now I, I will support not buying the ARV. And I think I know there will be a notice of motion coming at the next council meeting to discuss these other issues, the mental health response, the community safety issues. And I know the Board of Police Commissioners is going to be asked to do more work. I think probably than it, we've been leading toward this for some time, but to hear, hear the solicitor say that the Board of Police Commissioners could potentially outline uh, uh, direction to the chief around how something like this could be used and what the community expectations around it are. I think all that work needs to be done before we even talk about whether or not we're even going to buy something that is not threatening to the public like this. This is now to a large chunk of our public, to the vulnerable uh, members of our community, especially African Nova Scotians mm -hmm. watching what's happening to uh, folks in the United States. So uh, mm -hmm. I, I have changed my mind because I feel that we need to send that strong signal to the community and I hope Council will support Councillor Cleary and Councillor Smith's motion uh, to uh, no longer purchase this vehicle. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Councillor Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can you hear me okay? Yep. All right, thank you very much. So at last count, I've probably received about 800 or so emails on this topic. And, uh, you know, not all of them have been cut and paste from uh, a single source. And to those folks who have taken the time to reach out to us, I want to say, first of all, I hear you and I see you. And one of the things that has been said, you know, most often in those emails is, defund the police, defund the police. Well, what does that look like? What is the definition? And first and foremost, in my mind, what it comes down to is you can't defund without a plan. And here is my plan. Future police budgets, I want you to come to the table with a Wortley report checklist. And my support for any budget increases will be directly related to how many green check marks are next to Wortley report recommendations. Scott Wortley just said in an interview this week, if the police are going to talk positively and promise change and reform and promise equity, then they have to put their money where their mouth is and they have to start proving it. And that's where I'm at right now. It has been a year since the report set out some serious and meaningful changes that need to be made. 
linking police funding to successful Wortley report action items is one thing that I can do and that I am prepared to do. Uh, this is an opportunity to do things differently, to do things better, and I am taking this opportunity, and that's why I am in the same category as Councillor Mason. I've, I voted for this initially. I will be uh, voting in support of Councillor uh, Cleary's motion that is on the table right now. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Councillor Outfit. Uh, thank you, Mayor. And like the two uh, previous colleagues, I did uh, support this originally as well on the understanding that it was a rescue vehicle and a transport vehicle that would keep our officers safe. This is the same council that regularly says how lost we would be without our community response officers, our school officers, our traffic division officers who we work with almost on a daily basis. And we don't want to see any officers getting hurt on the way to an active shooting situation. What I am more interested in seeing down the road is something come forward that could be, as others have said, a Yukon, a Suburban, a van, uh, something like we've had before that could transport uh, officer safety, but not be used to uh, disperse uh, protesters, uh, not have ram bars, not have uh, gun, uh, you have guns coming out of it, the sort of thing, tear gas, water cannons, these sorts of things. But I do think I want to, our police to understand that their safety is still of utmost importance to me and to this council. Uh, having said that, I will not be supporting the purchase of this uh, present vehicle. And I'm glad that it looks like we can do that without uh, any significant uh, consequences. I do have a question for Jane regarding this motion. Right now, Sean's motion or amendment is that we take the money that would have been used towards this vehicle and and uh, and out of that uh, money do some some very good things and safety and etc. Now we we cannot use that reserve for that purpose. It's a fleet reserve, is my understanding, which is fine. It do, does sound like we'll need to amend this amendment to the proper reserve if that can be used for this purpose, although it's unusual for us to take reserves money out of reserves for operating. So I need a little bit of clar uh, clarification on that. And then I think uh, Sean might need a friendly amendment to change the reserve that this would come out of. So am, am I interpreting this correctly, Jane? Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you to, uh, to council. Uh, yes, you are councillor, you're interpreting it correctly. The um, uh, contingency operational stabilization reserve is fairly wide open. Um, it is very broad and actually do use that fund uh, for some operating items. So we could, uh, if council wishes to fund those items, we could use that as a source. Council does have the ability to waive the rules of the business case. Um, so if they wanted to use uh, Q531, you could waive the, the rules of that business case to use the funds there. I think um, my recommendation is that we would keep the uh, equipment funding in that uh, in that reserve for future years and use the um, contingent reserve Q421. All right, well, I, I'm happy with either of those options and so we'll see what Sean comes back with. But thank you for the clarification, Jane. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Councilor Nickel. Thank you. And uh, I want to remind and thank Jacques for setting the tone at our budget meeting, but I'm going to repeat a couple of quotes that he said. You never let a serious crisis go to waste. And that was former mayor of Chicago, Rahm Emanuel. But he went on further to say, what I mean by that is it's an opportunity to do things you think you could not do before. And so here we are. And Jacques also said, don't tell, don't tell me your vision, show me your budget. So both of them sort of set the context for the conversation that we're having now for the with this armored vehicle. And I've heard many motherhood statements and wise quotes since I'm in this job, but I'm always looking for the action, like exactly what the deputy mayor said, like put the money where, you, where your action, where you're saying, where you're put the money where the action needs to be. So I want to thank those the many hundreds, I, I lost count of the emails that we received and some of them were from people that I knew that were local, that were our students and our high schools and who know how important diversity is and they want to see change. So I thank them for that because 
at the end of the day, we can be in this job for so long that we kind of forget what it was that we really intended to do in this job. And that's, you know, so, you know, to have them remind us of the serious crisis that we're in right now financially and in every sense of the word crisis, to let me know that the, my original decision not to fund this armor vehicle was prudent and mostly for saying to us that as a council, don't let this crisis go to waste because it's an opportunity to do things that we think we could not do before. Public safety has always been my focus. It's been council's focus. It is one of our priority areas and our main priority area. So here's our chance to keep our public safe proactively rather than reactively. So I just wanted to say, you know, I've lived my whole life under the premise that community involvement is and helping your neighbor is really what's important. This pandemic seems to me, from my observation, that many are starting to realize that and they want to look out for one another. There are system, systemic problems in our society that result in us and seeing that the, for lack of not knowing who to contact for a certain situation, the police get called. The police are trained to respond in a certain way. It might not be the best way that they that that the, depending on the individual situation, but you know we should be putting our funds towards play, people that know how and who are trained to respond to mental health. And I've had many conversations with Amy Siciliano. I don't know if she's available to speak, but um, with regards to public safety and the great work that she's doing. But again, every business unit, as we know, when it comes to the budget, can all they all do great work, but it always relies on how much money they have to do it. So I guess my question to the motion on the floor is it's broken down with regards to um, I think it's four hundred and ten thousand dollars and five hundred that's left from after Sean has, you know, it says he's so he's got. 89,500 total as to what the what he's taken from the 500,000 that's in that, conting, that contingency reserve and I just wonder what are we doing with the rest because it just says oh and the rest just goes to support racism efforts but I would like to have a more more you know the actions to deputy mayor's point about the Wortley report like shouldn't the money be going towards you know addressing that and so that was, I guess it's a question to the mover in that regard, because I'm just looking at the math and trying to figure out just how much we are expect, what actions we're actually hoping to accomplish. Okay, <clears throat> did you have any, so we can wait for Councillor Clear to come back if he wishes. Did you have a question for Amy? Well, or? I just, but, but mostly, I guess to, um, and I don't think Amy, is Amy here? Uh, probably, is she here? Jacques, is Amy with us? I do not believe so, Mr. Mayor. I can certainly take any questions and take it back. And to that point, because it's going to the Office of Inver Diversity and Inclusion, which is great under Tracy, but just to remind me about the organizational chart, Amy reports to you as the CAO, as does Tracy directly no tracy reports to 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 caroline blair smith okay and amy reports is my is amy is my public safety advisor but she has a data her day-to-day -day reporting relationship was with paul johnson under bria who reports directly to me so i actually have meetings on a, about every two to three months i have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with amy okay. to talk about things now in this particular case if there's if the, if the intention of council is to spend the money balance of the money on uh, on anti-black racism measures or whatever we would have come back to council with uh, we would look at that and uh, engage uh, with amy and tracy and, and others in the organization to come up with some kind of a, a plan to spend that money we would let you know what that is um, if that's you know certainly if the motion stands you're telling me to spend the money on anti-black racism and i was simply giving you i'd be giving you a a report occasionally yeah. as to what the money is being spent on Right. And that's where I, I would want some clarification from Councillor Cleary, because at the end of the day, you know, a lot of times we, we put 
an amount attached to what we put the most importance to, but in fact, we really need to look at it more holistically as to where the, the, the funds would have more impact. And I'm just thinking that the actions on the Wortley report would sort of be a, a priority for me at this time. That being said, you know, a lot of the criticisms that we've heard is the fact that council does not, you know, have a public safety strategy, but we do. Yeah. So how we're going to implement that is what we need to see. Thank you. Yeah, I think if, if the motion is not more prescriptive, then it would fall to Jacques to use that money and to come back. And uh, Jacques, you would probably uh, report back to us in terms of how that money was being used. Because typically yeah, it's a staff yeah, report. Sure. Because if you if you uh, if you recall, we've been to council a number of times with an update on the public safety strategy implementation. Uh, that's happened, and this would be, you know, the same thing happens with uh, Tracy uh, Jones Grant and the uh, Diver Office of Diversity and Inclusion. We we come, we bring information reports before council as to what, what those activities are. And we would do that in this case because number typically the monies would likely be spent across uh, through my business unit through the Office of Public Safety falls under my business unit, and we're also fall under Tracy's uh, uh, office. Uh, that reports through to to Caroline. So my point is, we have great plans put in place. I want to see the actions for those come forward, as opposed to just sort of saying, you know, so much for you and so much for that. I want a more strategic approach. That was my only comment. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hensley. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor and Council. This has been one of those issues that have been thrust upon us that we didn't anticipate. Uh, sometimes events worldwide will affect us locally. And a situation like this is a case in point. Mr. Floyd did not expect to die that day, but he did. But let us death not be in vain. Thank God it was captured on video of what occurred so the whole world can see and witness the atrocities of that particular police officer and his colleagues did on a, on a, on a defenseless man. But with, with this, you know, we, we got to look at the separation of our responsibilities and obligations to our police force and to our people and to our citizens that we need to protect. And a piece of equipment like this was approved last year. It was approved through the process. And the question I had to ask is what changed? Well, the world has changed quite a bit from COVID-19 to the Black Lives Matter protests ongoing police brutality has magnified this issue and it's become a lightning rod. It's galvanized the issue for, for lots of folks. And I want to thank all those people that took the time, even though it was cut and paste a lot of those emails, I did have a few conversations with a few people back and forth that did uh, write articulate uh, emails and stuff and some other emails weren't so articulate. And then I could say is that uh, it took me a lot of time to think and ponder about this whole situation. But as we move forward, I think we have to do not, nothing symbolically, you know, something symbolically about this armored vehicle. You know, the question is, and I want to ask our, our legal authority in this in regards to the question I want to know is, is council getting in the realm of going beyond the spirit of the Donald Marshall inquiry where we are not supposed to be involved in the direct direction of police activities or, 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 or police or police direction? We're all going to provide overall global funding. It's a, it is the civil body of the police commission that has more of a policy implementation directing the police in regards to how they should move or utilize their budget. To, it, it, therefore, I have some concerns is that we are maybe stretching the our our, our responsibilities here and uh, getting into an area that we should not be uh, because of past political interference with police services. And also with the occupational health and safety matters, you know, are we going to be negligent in fraud and not having adequate protection for officers? I am somewhat um, comforted that the RCMP do have such an ARV available to us in, in Burnside. So therefore, the question may be is why do we need a second one? And I'm kind of leaning towards that way. Why do we need a second one? And I hope and pray to God that we never need to use any of these vehicles in the future. But uh, I want to get a clarification uh, from staff in regards to the Dollar Marsh Inquiry, our roles and responsibilities of council versus police commission on, on directing police on what they should or should not do uh, or what they can or cannot do and go from there. But uh, as this matter unfolds, uh, I'll, just read, I'll just read a quote from Frederick Douglass, a famous uh, 
African American activist, and and uh, his 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 quote was, "Man's greatness consists in his ability to do and the proper application of his powers to things needed to be done." Well, Mr. Mayor and Council, I'm prepared to rescind my earlier decision on on supporting the ARV of last year. I'm prepared to take a knee on it this time, and hopefully, to God, we don't need need to have a vehicle like this ever to begin in the future. But in the meantime, there are things we need to do in our communities to advance the, um, the African Nova Scotia community. And a, a lot of that can be done through some of our land use planning, some extensions of water and sewer services into certain critical areas that can help develop economic opportunities for the African Nova Scotia community. And I think Councilor Nichol knows exactly what I'm saying in regards to that. Main Street to the Kuma property is one example that we can do things for the Preston communities that we, is on the doorstep of Metro. And I ask that uh, those things be brought into consideration in the future. But in the meantime, uh, like I said, I'm prepared to take a knee on this situation of the ARV. But the question is, I want to know, are legal authorities stepping into police matters? John? Mr. Mayor, through you to Council. Uh, thank you for the question, Councillor. The, the legislative framework that all of the statutory actors, you know, fall under here, which is our police act and the by and the regulations in the bylaw align with the findings from the uh, Donald Marshall Jr. inquiry. And, and fundamentally that is accomplished by the prohibition on not only council, but also the members of the board of police commissioners that um, they have no uh, role or can exercise no jurisdiction with respect to the actual day to day operations of the police department. That's within the sole purview of the chief, and that's intended to prevent um, political interference in an investigation or otherwise. Council's obligation under the Police Act is to establish a police force and, and to provide resources to that police force. The specifics of those, um, those resources in terms of the annual budget is something which is within the jurisdiction of the Board of Police Commissioners based on the policy direction that they wish to take and wish to see the police take um, mm -hmm. through the process. So no, I don't I don't feel that there is any disconnect here. Council is doing its job in terms of the overall funding of uh, and the provision of resources. And in, and in this case, I would remind you the ARV is is being provided as equipment through fleet as opposed to uh, purchase through the police budget. And the, the Board of Police Commissioners is then tasked with you know, uh, reviewing and establishing policies with respect to um, the operations of the police force. I hope that answers. It does. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that and I appreciate that. And um, uh, I'll come back with some other comments later. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Zarowski. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and um, thank you for your words at the beginning of uh, the budget session this morning. Um, a number of points I wanted to make is um, for many of us, uh, we trust the police services implicitly, but for many others of us, especially those with different colored skin, it's a different story. So this it, it's it's not enough to just not fund um, this particular uh, machine that we were considering buying, but we also have to rethink how we uh, apply our police measures to our community because for 400 years, we have had laws in place and rules in place that have said that everybody is equal. And in actual fact, all of us sitting here know that that was not the case. That a significant fraction of our population is racist, is systemically racist, and is the driving force behind a lot of what is so unsettling in our society. I won't be supporting this. I didn't support this. And I, I will not support the purchase of a vehicle that is so obviously a militaristic offshoot. Um, I want to see the money go into other areas, but 
this is just not enough. I, I, I think this this needs to be a stepping stone into more comprehensive ways of looking at things. We debated the fact that if you were black in, in Halifax, that you were six times more likely to have an intersection with the HRP. And that has never really been dealt with, the systemic racism. And um, not only is this particular vehicle militaristic in my assessment, it is also symbolic of how we tend to deal with disagreements by having something that gives us greater force. We have so many tools at our availability, both in the HRP and in HRM, that we're not using properly at this juncture. So I, I want to see an end to the 400 years of systemic discrimination against those with different colored skin. And I won't call it race because it's not. It's just skin color. And it's abhorrent. Enough is enough. Um, I, I would like us to just move on and start looking at restructuring how we're going to do this. Because right now, I, I see this as a bit of a token gesture. And we're all jumping on the bandwagon. I think there's something, something really um, the fish in Denmark come to mind, um, and I would like to see it solved. So um, thank you all for your words. Thank you for the introduction, and um, I'll let someone else speak. Thank you. Councillor Mancini. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and colleagues. You know, uh, Councillor Smith's uh, memory of the timeline when we first started discussing this armor vehicle is bang on. Uh, I did come to a Board of Police Commission meeting the day before we were uh, voting on the final budget. Uh, and the uh, police chief of the time, uh, Chief Blay, had retired. And so it was left to his deputies at the time to make that presentation. During that presentation of the Board of Police Commission meeting, the question was asked, what will the vehicle be used for? What will it not be used for? And, and the deputy at the time said it would not be used for crowd control or things of that sort. Uh, he did mention at the time that they were going to bring policy back uh, at a later date once the budget was approved. So I want to come back to that in a moment. Next day, we went into the uh, budget meeting. And then at that budget meeting, another representative of the police department uh, gave the presentation. And that representative, when asked, when I think it was Councillor Cleary asked the question, would this be used for crowd control? And he said, it's possible. So, you know, it's the policy question I have right now. And I was wondering if John Traves can come online, is that the deputy at the time said they were going to go away and create policy and then share that with the board of the police commission. My question to Mr. Traves is, can the Board of Police Commission, uh, after receiving policy, direct what's in that policy? So, for example, if a vehicle is purchased, whether it's this vehicle or, as uh, Councilor Mason suggests, a less threatening vehicle, can the Board of Police Commission say, uh, we allow that to be used for uh, rescue and those types of things, but we would do not allow it to be used for uh, crowd control, as an example. John? Mr. Mayor, through you to the councillor, the board has sole jurisdiction over matters delegated to it, including ensuring that the police services are delivered in a manner consistent with community values, needs, and expectations. As, as one, one point in terms of answering your question. Uh, so certainly you can look at policies with those sorts of lenses on it. Uh, provided you're not giving day-to-day -day direction. Um, and so, you know, it really would depend on the wording of a particular policy and whether or not it, that, you know, is a matter that then fits within your jurisdiction. But broadly speaking, yes. Well, thank you, John. You know, it's interesting. Uh, uh, during the Board of Police Commission meeting, when we did see that, I was a year ago, I wasn't in favor of the vehicle as presented. When it went to budget, I wasn't in favor, did not vote for it when it came to budget. And today uh, I support Councillor Cleary. I believe, you know, as Councillor Mason suggests, there, there is a vehicle, a tool that's needed, a resource that's needed to help keep our police officers safe, but not as threatening as the one that's been proposed to us today or we, we've been talking about. But prior to having that conversation, 
I would like to see the policy created. Policy created first and then decide whether or not uh, that vehicle would be appropriate. To. So today I support Councillor Cleary. I thank him and I thank all of you colleagues. I do at some point in time hope we have an opportunity to talk about the the, uh, uh, the response to many of the emails we have received around defunding and police and reform of police because that's a very important question and my concern is we have a conversation today we make a decision today we need to make sure we keep this conversation going for uh, uh, for a long long time thank you mr mayor <clears throat> thank you uh, councillor stretch thank you very much your worship and uh, thank you colleagues for the discussion today uh, I, uh, I as well have uh, received hundreds of emails and uh, I take them all very seriously. Some were more personal than others, uh, but either way, uh, the intent was very clear. But what uh, seemed very apparent to me was that the majority were from young people, uh, the youth of, uh, of our society. And I recall years ago uh, uh, in, in the 4-H movement, someone said to me that the learners of today are the leaders of tomorrow. And I remember your worship, as many of you do, 20, 30, 40 years ago, we were all young once and uh, we were going to change the world. Well, I'm not sure how we made out, but these folks are on the cusp of doing just that. And I want to make sure that uh, our council is on the right side of, of this issue. You know, uh, some people talk about whose decision is this? Is it the commissions? Is it the police department? Is it councils? Well, this is our decision. And uh, the message uh, that we send today is going to be very important and is going to resonate throughout the community. It hurts me to uh, think that there are members of our community that uh, view uh, a purchase like this as uh, an intimidation upon them and that it uh, scares them. And I understand that. I also reflect on a decision uh, uh, that we made a couple of years ago. And, and you know, before I, I, I touch on that, uh, it is our prerogative as elected officials to change our minds. And if we can't adjust, and indeed, if we can't reconsider them, what are we here for? So I'm not afraid to say that uh, I am going to reconsider today and I am going to change uh, my position. But I want to reflect on a decision we had a couple of years ago relating uh, to uh, the Cornwallis statue. There was one young person that stood in front of us, uh, uh, Rebecca Thomas, and her words resonated with me. No different than uh, the youngest member of our council, Lindell Smith's comments resonated on me uh, before lunch or indeed uh, uh, that of uh, L. Jones, who I hear uh, speak quite often uh, in the media. Uh, these young people have a real message and it is up to us to interpret that and to act accordingly. So I will be changing my vote. I will be changing uh, or will be supporting uh, uh, Councillor Cleary and indeed Councillor Smith's uh, amendment as it stands. It uh, was important to me that, uh, that we did find out as it relates to exposing the taxpayers that uh, we'll likely get by without uh, penalty. Uh, by cancelling this contract and it's 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 just a contract but it's going to send a bigger message and uh, indeed uh, that is the more important part to me. We also have a partnership between regional police and uh, the RCMP and that partnership I take very seriously so I'm also uh, heartened to know that we have uh, an armoured vehicle if need be uh, that is owned by our partner in policing and indeed uh, we saw it used just recently in the tragedy uh, uh, out this direction uh, relating to uh, Portepec. It also bothers me immensely that we see vehicles like this being used against citizens south of our border down in the United States. And I can't imagine uh, the fear or the intimidation that uh, uh, people see. And I don't want to be part of that. So for me, this is very simple. Uh, cancel it and uh, move on. So uh, I will be supporting the motion as it stands. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think Councillor Russell is next. Uh, Councillor Walker, you've spoken once, I think. Yeah, OK, I'll come back to you. Councillor Russell, followed by Councillor Austin. Thank you very much. Um, I will also be supporting this motion. Um, we have received an overwhelming number of emails over the past uh, over the past week. Uh, my inbox has something like 850 uh, emails, and I've engaged in conversation with some of the people who have uh, sent them. And and just to uh, develop a little bit better of an understanding of of some of the uh, of some of the people here, but I've also um, not been in favor of this type of vehicle since 
since I came on council back in October and there was some confusion about uh, whether or not I voted for this vehicle uh, in the first place and this vehicle was voted upon uh, before I became on council and, and it was tendered before uh, before I was elected. So I didn't have an, an opportunity to cast a vote in the the first time. I will absolutely be voting to uh, cancel the contract at this point. Um, we do have two police forces here in, in Halifax and, and we are lucky to do that. Uh, we have the Halifax Regional Police working in concert with the RCMP and the RCMP do have this vehicle that uh, we are able to be or we are able to call upon should it be needed. There are specially trained members of the RCMP who would be able to uh, use that vehicle as well who um, who would be engaged with it uh, and I'm making a presumption there but because we have one of these vehicles available and I cannot re recollect any time within the city where something like this would have saved a life. Um, I can't see any justification for supporting it. I also made uh, comments about this vehicle shortly after I uh, was seated around the council table and have not been in support of this since the beginning. So I will just be continuing, uh, be continuing with that. So I would uh, thank you very much. And, and uh, I, again, we'll be voting against the motion. Uh, I think for the motion, you mean Councillor Russell? I mean for the motion. My apologies. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Austin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you, colleagues, and uh, thank you, Councillor Cleary, for first raising this uh, uh, back in 2019 and bringing this forward again today. Um, when we look at what's happening in the, I mean, a lot has certainly changed in the course of uh, the last two weeks. Um, what we're seeing really is a crisis in policing in North America, um, writ large. Um, the murder of George Floyd, the brutality that's been on display in the streets of many American cities, uh, it, it is abhorrent. And for myself, as I think about it, I mean, uh, to, to not to go too much to personal experiences or anything, but I mean, as a as a white kid growing up, I mean, the the teaching was very much the police are your friends, the police are here for your safety, um, and that 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 I suspect that's true of most people in our community um, who have the same skin color as me, and you know, I remember the first time I really had my assumptions challenged on that, where I felt a visceral anger at what I was seeing, and that was the death of Robert Jukanski by the RCMP at the Vancouver airport, a man holding a stapler killed by the police when he was clearly in distress, and then the cover-up that was by the officers that followed the obstruction of justice. And I think what's happened with the rise of cell of cell phones everyone now has a camera in their pocket and the curtain on what our people of color would would tell us has always been the case has been really pulled back and it's no longer something that we can ignore and i think i will have more to say on this as we get to the second part of this discussion today on the police budget and where we go from there, I think we're going to have some more discussion there. Um, I'll, I'll save some of my commentary for that. Um, on the vehicle, um, for me, I voted against it originally because I was reasonably confident based on what we knew that the RCMP having a vehicle in the province that we have this capability. Um, from a risk point of view, how many of these things do we need? What if the one we buy is broken down? Do we need two? Do we need three? Do we need four? I mean, at a certain point, you have to say, well, this is the appropriate level of resources for the risk that we face. And I think it's worth remembering in an active shooter situation, that has changed markedly over the years too. I mean, it used to be you cordon the perimeter, a cold polytechnique, Columbine showed the risk of that. And my understanding of police training is it's much more, you don't wait, you have to engage because while you wait, people are going to die. 
so the the number of situations where a vehicle like this would actually really come in handy, even in an active shooter situation, I think is pretty minute to the point that we certainly in a pro in a relatively peaceful province of a million people, I don't think we need two of these. And so that's why I voted against it originally. Everything I've seen since in terms of what's happened in the last two weeks, uh, there's certainly been nothing that has dissuaded me from that. And uh, I think it's worth that we as council do something on this because there is a significant portion of our population that feels threatened by this, does not have a lot of trust in our police. And that is something that is uh, that we, we have to consider. It is absolutely imperative that we do. Um, I will close by just saying that, um, you know, to the point about where this comes from, a, you know, from a budgeting point of view, um, to the CFO's point, I think we should absolutely waive the rules and we should take this money and we should put it into these measures. Maybe that's symbolic, but every now and then a little bit of symbolism goes a long way. I think we should delete this money and make it clear that this money is going towards uh, the programs that Councilor Cleary has outlined in his motion because I think that's really what we need here. Thank you. Thank you. So I think everybody who wants to speak the first time has. I'm going to go to Councillor Smith. Thank you, Mayor. I, I want to really quickly, um, but but thoughtfully think, thank Councillor Cleary for the work on this. And and you know uh, whether you agree with with him or not, one thing that Councillor Cleary does, you you always you always stick to your your gut. And from day one, you 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 stuck to your feelings on this and in this motion that that you worked on today shows um, that your intention is there. So I want to speak um, to the other aspects of the motion that that is is to me equally as important as as the the armored vehicle. Um, you know, one piece is is the fact that putting money back into the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Uh, if some of you might remember uh, one of my first budget motions that I put forward was was uh, to put $60,000 into the diversity inclusion office because they had no engagement money. They had no community outreach money. They had no programming money. It was just office, uh, an office uh, that had staffing. And I don't mean just, but that's they didn't have the resources they needed to do that. So, you know, it, it, this money and if you speak to the folks that, that are in that office who do amazing work, you'd know how far they make that money go to reach the community as best as they can with the resources at hand. Um, and also, you know, our, our public safety office and everyone within there, if you're not, if you know, if you're, if you're not familiar with what that office does, please, please look it up. Um, our community mobilization teams do amazing work within our communities, Mulgrave Park, uh, North Preston and Uniac Square. And, you know, that work is what we want to see as a city and you know we'll have that discussion later but when we talk about defunding and, and i like to use the word reallocation those are the places where money needs to be put so this motion not only talks about the armored vehicle but really putting money places that think about the people and the impacts that it, it has on them so so i also don't want those pieces to get lost because i know the discussion around the armored vehicle is important but i want to make sure that we don't forget about the the other aspects which is um equally as important and I don't know if if we uh, have heard from the chief and if that is something this is kind of my question now is do we want the chief to weigh in at all uh, at this point in discussion because we haven't heard heard from 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 him and I know he's on the call so I'm just wondering if the chief has any 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 anything he wants to address during this discussion because I think it'd be important to at least include his voice in in this discussion. Well, there haven't been any questions for him. Uh, he would ask if there was questions. Is there anything specific? Uh, no, I'm just, I'll just, if no, I'm I mean, just I'm giving him. Chief, if there's anything specific okay. the chief wants to say. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you, uh, Councillor and Commissioner, and through you, Mayor, uh, to Council. Uh, what I would tell you is, is uh, what I would send to you in an email uh, very recently through the clerk. And that is the armored rescue vehicle is uh, a tool that uh, is useful for the police to respond to life-threatening uh, bullets flying situations where we either need to deploy to be closer to the threat 
or respond to uh, potentially rescue someone or uh, those kind of things. So uh, it's for those times when uh, firearms are being discharged and we have to take some action. Uh, the use of them in uh, protests or demonstrations um, has not been done. We have responded to a number of them here in Halifax. Uh, the mayor was at uh, uh, one with me a week ago uh, just tonight. CAO was there, uh, Councillor Mancini was there, and uh, from our vantage point, I don't think any of us actually saw the police that were on duty. The police that were there supporting the demonstrators, the police that were there ensuring order and looking after traffic and those kind of things. The armored rescue vehicle has a very specific use and uh, generally uh, speaking, many, many major cities in Canada have them. Um, the vast majority of these vehicles are purchased post event. Uh, we have an opportunity here to um, obtain another tool that will be of assistance to the police, uh, understanding its presence, its image, its effect on people. Um, I've been very vocal about that uh, also in the media of late. So uh, it is a tool uh, that has great use for the police and uh, subject to any questions, I'll leave it at that. Councillor Smith. Thank you, Chief. If I, the only the only comment, the only comment I'll, I'll make really quickly is, is, you know, we when this discussion first came, it was it was it was communicated to us as a, a rescue vehicle. And you know, one of the things that jotted out to me right away when I looked at the tender was, uh, you know, it had armored rotating roof hatches with gun ports, minimum of three gun ports per side, one roof hatch in one rear door, total of eight ports, front mounted power ram with height control compatible conducting mechanical breaches. So you know, when I look at that, I don't look at a, a rescue vehicle. I also look at something that can be used offensive. Um, Lee, so so those are the concerns that I think we had from the beginning, and and I understand um, where not only the chief, but even even before our presentations on this. So I I, I just hope that that if we look at this in the future, for, we look at what the actual need is, and not what we could possibly do with it to kind of get the extra pieces. So I'll I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Thank you Councillor. Councillor Karsten. Mike almost got me again. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And uh, uh, this has been a very good, positive conversation, I believe. Uh, certainly uh, doesn't take long to add up the numbers as to where this is going, uh, which just for the record, because it's been quite a while, we had a lunch break. I am supporting the motion Councillor Clary's putting on the floor or has put on the floor. Uh, I, I just want to take my last uh, minute or so, Mr. Mayor, uh, just to have a comment or two directed uh, uh, to the CAO, uh, to the chief, uh, and to his staff through the CAO uh, to take a message that, you know, I feel very strong that this is the right step for us. I believe that for all of the emails that we've received, uh, this is a response by saying we hear you. Uh, and in fact, that we are wanting to be part of the solution. But I also feel very strong, Mr. Mayor, until such time as we move into a second phase of looking at uh, what policing may look like in the future. I personally, and, and I'm speaking only for myself, don't necessarily like the term defund. I think that has uh, really for the rest of the population who hasn't waited in this uh, uh, matter to a large degree, uh, other than uh, scattered few, uh, has a very negative connotation, and I wish it was more around, uh, let's see if we can restructure what we already have and, and do a better job at it, but that's for others to decide. Until we get there, Mr. Mayor, my message uh, goes through the CAO to the chief and, and to his staff, uh, and in fact, for all of those that have emailed us. Continue, please, however, to be part of the solution yourselves by uh, showing the respect that the police are due. Uh, I say that because I got an email this morning, Mr. Mayor, uh, that certainly didn't represent 99% uh, of all of the 
uh, well-intended emails, but it was somewhat vitriol in saying that, uh, that in fact, uh, one of the first things we should do, uh, which would have happened if we moved it, uh, uh, which would have happened if we left the cut to 5 million, and that was to get a, uh, to do away and cut community response officers. And this email went on to say that that's a great place to start because it's nothing but a PR stunt on the part of uh, uh, those in charge. And I just want to caution that kind of rhetoric. Uh, our community response office officers and uh, uh, certainly the community response program itself is a very positive aspect of policing here in the, in the Halifax Regional Municipality. So uh, without further ado, Mr. Mayor, I'll leave it at that. Uh, other than to say, uh, other than to say, it's something that's very fresh and foremost on our minds is that, uh, yes, Eddie Stevenson was a community response officer. So let's keep a balanced approach as we move forward and find solutions in continuing to respect the 99 plus percent of all of the police officers uh, that put on their uniform in the morning, men and women, who are in, in this for the very, very right reason and that's to protect and serve and, and do put their lives on, on the line on a daily basis. Uh, without that uh, being uh, adhered to, if you will, and, and look, that's not, everyone's been very respectful. I'm not saying that this hasn't been a very respectful week in, in our municipality, but, uh, and, and so it's not even about it. It's, it's encouragement until we get to a place that you feel more confident that uh, we're moving in the right direction. Please continue to show respect uh, and, and uh, uh, in our law enforcement. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Adams. He's gone again. You're shown as being on mute, Steve. It's flicking back and forth on you. OK, OK. I'll... You got to hit it once and then not touch it again. Still muted, Steve. Get, get Lindell. Lindell's used Still to dealing with seniors and computers. Get him to do it. Maybe. Maybe after another 28 years, right, folks? <laughs> I might get that right. I'm not sure. I'm going to not even touch this. I think Corey's doing this remotely. Okay. So, you. okay, thank you. Um, I, I'd ask if, uh, with Council's indulgence, that um, two things with regard to the motion. I, I have it uh, here. Uh, I, I'd ask that it be split, and this first part, like um, the motion be amended to rescind Council's decision. Uh, to reserve the fund armored uh, vehicle and return the funds, $500,000 to the vehicle fleet and equipment reserve Q531. And then the second part, if uh, council will, would um, uh, be amenable to this, it says restore the following cuts. I think cuts should be taken out. I think it should be re restore the, the uh, following funding uh, in the in the recast budget. But I'd like to have the motion split at that particular juncture, Your Worship. Okay, um, because there are effectively two two motions in there. So Cheryl or John, that can be done. That can be done. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Councillor. Councillor Walker. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, as chair of the Audit and Finance Committee, I guess I should remind Council that uh, the vehicle, if it goes back, goes back to the fleet reserve. And I've already checked with the CFO that there is another reserve it can come out of. But we are talking about new money for this budget that wasn't already in it. And staff still have to find that money and come forward to council. So uh, just remember when we're doing all this, it's not money that we found. It's new money we have to create. And when you're in, 11th hour of a budget, which staff are prepared to not increase the taxes any more than before. And we are adding things into this budget. And I don't, would hope today we don't add a whole lot into this budget. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, to echo some of the words that Councillor Carson said about community response officers, uh, I'm hoping that uh, the police commission and our police departments will look at trying to get back into the communities where they have. In the past, I remember the community, plus, community policing initiatives that were introduced to try and get people back uh, in, the, in the community. But with technology and stuff, we lost our community police offices because now a lot of stuff can be done in the cars instead of having offices in, in, the, in the community center in a in local area. Uh, so we kind of missed that contact we used to have with our citizens on patrol folks. Um, I'm also thinking about our our um, drug awareness programs with the DARE programs in schools and, and, our, and our school liaison officers. Our police officers are our community ambassadors and I've always felt that and then we should try and get back to that. The RCMP a few years ago had a community constable program in the Preston area and I think it was a great outreach of trying to engage and, uh, and, gain, and gain support of the community and it worked well but the funding ran out after the federal government's funding passed. So I think we need to talk with our provincial and federal counterparts to make sure that we do have adequate resources for our policing services. I am not in favor of defunding as, as some people call our, 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 our uh, police departments. Uh, I believe that perhaps, uh, as Councilor Smith said, maybe reallocation of funds or redirection of priorities uh, may be necessary. We talked about this ABR. I wish I wished our police commission would have gave us an official comment on this instead of hearing things in the media and having discussed but never told to us directly of what their position was on this ABR. Um, you know, for instance, I've also concerned about you know if if this is considered as a defensive um, piece of equipment. And I'm worried about our bicycle patrols because during the ex the uh, uh, extinction rebellion on the bridge uh, on the bridge uh, plaza, our officers use their bicycles as barricades. You know, are we going to have that going to be coming back thrown at us? The bicycle should not be allowed for our police officers as a part of their duties. I don't really think so. It all depends on how people want to spin things in regards to our police and trying to protect the, the, the general greater good. I said before. Our first responders, our police and fire, are, in my opinion, essential services and are sacred. And I believe that not just cutting funding for the sake of cutting funding is going to be adequate. So I'm, I'm prepared to, to, like I said earlier, uh, have a reconsideration of this ABR. But I'm also hoping that we take up the challenge from the Prime Minister who announced this the other day about body cam. I believe body cameras in every officer in the street is necessary, not just to protect the officer, but also protects the public. We know firsthand what occurs, how the, what the police officer sees and, and what the citizen uh, is, has, has is acting. So we know exactly how the, the police officer may have approached that situation properly or not. So I'm hoping that uh, down the road there will be a good discussion on, on body cameras and I will be supporting uh, the need of opening all our officers in the street with the body camera for the protection of themselves but also protection of our general public. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much Mr. Mayor and Council. Thank you. So I'm, I'm just going to say this, that uh, I was prepared to speak to this, but I generally speak um, at council when um, what I want to say hasn't been said, and I think it's been said by many people. And what I would say is I'm looking at the screen at a couple of folks, probably closer to my generation than to Councillor Smith's, who I've talked to about this in the last four or five days who, like me, supported the purchase of this armored vehicle because we believe in protecting our police officers and their safety, but who have found ourselves not, not on a matter of dollars and cents, but on a matter of morality and representing our constituents and understanding legitimately where they're coming from, have decided that uh, we change our mind on this. and. Um, I'm proud of the discussion that I've seen at this council today, as I've often been. And I think it's the right thing to do. Um, and I do think we need to look at a lot of the things that we can do. As I said earlier, I'll let my earlier statement um, stand in my place. We have to look at ourselves individually and collectively. And we have to recognize that the way we see things change, you know, um, 
it changes with time and we have to be prepared to do things that maybe yesterday seemed unreasonable. And to me, this is one of those occasions. A lot of people I respect on council supported this decision. Not some who I respect greatly didn't, but a lot of people who I support on this council are like me. They 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 supported this, but this is an important statement that we're making today in this vote. And uh, um, it's not an anti-police vote. It is a vote recognizing that we need to step up and there has to be a stronger relationship between populations like the African Nova Scotian population and the police and the people that they elect to represent them. Until we have a more diverse council, which we need to work towards, we have to be the voice as well as the eyes and the ears of everybody. So um, I'm pleased with the discussion. Um, I don't see any other speakers. Mr. Mayor, it's uh, Councillor Cleary. Can I just say a couple words to close? Yes, you can, please. Thank, thank you so much. Um, I'm a little choked up. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with our discussion, uh, colleagues. Uh, it is in, in many ways the same discussion we had a year ago, but in so many ways a very different discussion um, than we had uh, back in 2019. Uh, and, and I agree on both sides, actually, with a lot of what's been said. Um, and I'm not going to reiterate it. Uh, and I agree that our, our, the, the staff who protect our society need tools, but they need the right tools. Um, and as has been mentioned uh, by Councillor Austin, uh, by, by uh, Councillor Stretch, by Councillor Hensby, uh, by Councillor Russell, the RCMP have one. And, and if, you know, uh, unfortunately the need ever arose, it's available to us. We have a in many of our services with police, we have an integrated model, our CPHRP, and if we can't borrow their vehicle, then there's something wrong with our integrated model. Um, and, and if at some time HRP feel that they absolutely need the, uh, some sort of uh, uh, ARV, um, I've looked online uh, last year and this year at all kinds of different options, uh, armored SUVs, you know, vans, brink style trucks, whatever. Um, and I don't know how many of you have ever been in or around military style vehicles, especially armored vehicles, even light armored vehicles, uh, all the way up to tanks. And they always seem to have uh, impressive names, aggressive names like grizzlies and coyotes and, and leopards and uh, cougars. Um, when you get in one, you feel different. Uh, your adrenaline runs higher. You feel more aggressive. And so if we do need a tactical vehicle or an armored vehicle, and I've seen all kinds of that, I even have like little ladders and lifts on them to, you know, get into over walls and get into buildings. You know, if we need one, then I think it's appropriate for the Board of Police Commissioners to develop that policy before we buy one so that we all know what we're getting ourselves into. So there isn't this kind of confusion and discussion. But listen, I just want to end it there and say thank you so much uh, for this discussion. And, um, I'm, I'm happy to, to vote on this now and, and hopefully remembering that we need two thirds uh, majority here, colleagues, uh, to see if we can uh, cancel this order and, and invest that money in things that I think will make our community even, even stronger. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. So Thanks, we'll need that two thirds majority at Council, correct, Joe? Right. We're making a recommendation. This is a recommendation to Council, so. Um, that's what we will have to do at council. We've been asked to split the motion. So is everybody clear what the first part of the motion is? Can everybody go on their chat screen and? Is it, so Mr. Mayor, is that, uh, it's Mancini, is it, is it the motion that Jane Frazier posted at 1256? Can we point to what the actual full motion is? Motion Cheryl has just reposted. I think Cheryl has just reposted it. Yeah, Cheryl posted at 1.38 PM. Is that the one? I've got 2.03 p.m. I have 2.03 okay. p.m. Oh, I see. Okay. Motion, very last item in the uh, in the chat. So the motion is that the motion be amended to rescind council's decision to reserve fund the armored vehicle and return the funds $500,000 to the vehicle fleet and equipment reserve Q531. That's number one, okay? Correct, Joe? Yes. Are we ready for the question on that? Question. Uh, Question. Okay. And by the way, uh, Tony, you don't have to identify yourself when you buzz in. Uh, you've got a very distinctive voice. Thank you. Councillor <laughs> <laughs> Stretch. For the motion. 
Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Councillor Foxton. For the motion. Councillor Nickel. Yes. Councillor Austin. Yes. Councillor Mancini. For the motion. Councillor Mason. For the motion. Councillor Smith. For the motion. Councillor Cleary. Yes. Councillor Walker. For. Councillor Adams. Against. Councillor Zorowski. For the motion. Councillor Whitman. Still for the motion. Councillor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Arthur. Yes. Mayor Savage. For the motion. Yes. To declare the motion passed, it's just one dissenting vote. Uh, we'll look then at the next part of the uh, motion, which is that the budget to include the following funding in the recast 2021 budget. 53,500 in programming dollars for the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, 25,000 for special projects, plus 11,000 to support business units to advance public safety strategy actions in the Public Safety Office and use the remaining funds to support anti-Black racism efforts and initiatives with funding to come from the General Contingency Reserve. Ready for the question? Uh, a quick question, Your Honor. Um, the remaining funds, are we just assuming that that is <laughs> that amount from $500,000 or yes. is that just an open ended? Thank you. I think it is the, the, the remaining amount. No. I see Councillor Walker, the Chair of Audit Finance. No, no. You did. James? So, Your Worship, before James speaks, it's Councillor Cleary. So, my intention in the motion. Uh, if you remember, we set aside 500,000 from the um, uh, from the reserve uh, in fleet. But when the request for proposals came back, uh, the estimate was 368-ish thousand. And so my intention was that it was the 368. And then if you subtract uh, the 25, the 11, and the 53 and a half, you get 278,500. That was my intention. So that way, to Council Russell, uh, or sorry, Council Walker's point earlier about not spending new money. My intention was not to spend new money over what we had budgeted. So it was the uh, uh, amount back for the RFP on the ARV. That's a lot of acronyms. Uh, 368 minus the new money that would leave 278. So not 500 uh, minus those new things. That was my intention. Jane, is that the uh... We've already voted on 500 though, right? Uh, we have, that is the, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor, through to council, that is the amount that was in the reserve. Um, so that amount would have to go back regardless. Well, now that yes. the, the motion has been passed. Uh, so if you want it, uh, if there was some more, if you want to be a bit more specific in the second part of the motion and then detail that the remaining amount is $278,000, that may add some clarity. 278,000, Councillor Clary? That would be uh, friendly uh, from my perspective. I, I don't know how Councillor Smith feels about that as a second. That's a friendly amendment, Jane, you just made. That's friendly for me. Yeah. Okay. We all clear? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, Councillor Walker asked if I, if I missed uh, I didn't see it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, Jane has found this money in another account, so. It's two different funds of money, so we shouldn't be confused here. Uh, one went back and we found it in another account and it doesn't affect the tax rate. Right. Thank you. Oh, uh, oh good. We'll get more questions. Councillor Nickel. <laughs> I said quick question. Just for a clarification to my earlier points about the funding and tying it to the Wortley report, I believe Councillor Cleary is referring to the initiatives within that report when it comes to supporting anti-black racism efforts that's was just my point he, he said he would respond to that but i didn't hear him sorry let me go to councillor austin then i'll come back to councillor cleary uh, councillor austin a question yes uh so maybe i missed it along the way here uh i didn't realize we had an actual specified source here 
Um, so what happens to the money that the 500,000 that's currently reserved in fleet? Jane? Mr. Mayor, through to the councillor, it goes back into the reserve and that uh, those funds can be used for uh, other fleet vehicles, either corporate fleet uh, or equipment. So I guess my, my question would be, so we have money that would be staying in the fleet reserve for something that we are not buying. Why wouldn't we just release that out of fleet? Like why, why does it stay there? Uh, Mr. Mayor, through to the council, because it can be used for things like snow plows, heavy equipment, uh, uh, machinery to clear the sidewalks, things like that, whatever is in the business case. So the business case for that reserve specifies what it can be used for and subject to council changing the business case, that's what the funds will be used for in the future. But presumably we put money in there for when we want to buy a snow plow or a garbage truck or, you know, whatever uh, pickup truck, whatever the fleet piece would be. Um, I don't know, I'm probably, <laughs> probably the accounting of this just does not really make all that much sense to me from a simple, well, how much money do we have and how much money do we have going out? I guess in the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. I, to me, I don't know why we would leave money there in that reserve that we're not using and then draw a different reserve. But in the end of the day, it, it, I guess it doesn't really matter. Thanks. Hmm. It doesn't affect the tax rate and the we, we get the money that we want for the pro for the uh, programs that we want. Correct. Yes, it's complicated. Councillor, I'll go to Councillor Cleary now and then to Councillor Karsten. Councillor Cleary, I, uh, just in terms of Councillor Nichols' comment. So uh, Councillor Nichol and I uh, chatted a bit. And so the idea is, um, if people recall from Dr. Wortley's report, uh, there is supposed to be an update going back to the Board of Police Commissioners on the actions from that report. And so uh, much of that report had to deal with anti-black racism. And so in my mind, uh, pretty much any action that comes out of that report would certainly be eligible in terms of my intent for this motion. Right. Right. And uh, it, I certainly wouldn't exclude it from uh, any of Wortley's recommendations in terms of, but I, I wanna leave that to the discretion of the CAO and also within the purview of the Board of Police Commissioners who are the ones who are receiving those recommendations back and the action updates uh, from, uh, from the chief. Okay, thank you for that. Councillor Carson. Councillor Carson, did you have a, a point? I was trying to do it to me, Mr. Mayor, but there we are. So I've never been one to uh, to like the uh, marketing ploy of uh, things being at $1.99 and things being at $2.99. Why not round it off? And that's why, uh, quite frankly, at the 278, I think we're at now, uh, I really don't understand why we don't round that off, uh, quite frankly. And I would ask uh, for the mover and secondary to consider a friendly amendment. Just round it off at uh, 300,000. The money will be good, used for good purposes. There's 500,000 going back in the fleet reserve, draw out 300,000 for this uh, good cause, makes it even. 200,000 in reserves to the plus. Uh, give that some quick. Uh, it comes to the chair of audit is laughing. It, it's friendly to me, Mr. Mayor. I just don't want Councillor Walker to have a heart attack on uh, Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's, it, it, to me, it just makes the world sense, Councillor Clary. So if that's your motion, uh, I'll support a second, friendly seconder. So that's a friendly amendment, Councillor Clary, and the seconder, Councillor Smith? Yep. The, the motion is three hundred thousand dollars. That makes sense. Uh, you, you'd make a or good motion for Bob Barker. Should it be two hundred ninety-nine thousand nine hundred ninety-nine, Councillor Carston? Is that what you're saying, Mr. Mayor? I'll buy you coffee at ninety-nine cents tomorrow. <laughs> Let me know where. All right, let's go. Uh, ready for the question, colleagues? Question. Question. Councillor Stretch. For the motion. Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Councillor Carson. <laughs> For the motion. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Nickel. Yes. Councillor Austin. Yes. Councillor Mancini. No, Just kidding. For the motion. 
Councillor Mason. For the motion. Councillor Smith. For the motion. Councillor Cleary. Yes. Councillor Walker. For. Councillor Adams. For. Councillor Sarowski. For the motion. Councillor Whitman. For. Deputy Mayor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Oti. Voting yes. And Mayor Savage. Voting for the motion. I declare the motion carried. Uh, Colleagues, uh, where's the kickback coming? Where did we get the kickback? Uh, I think that was, I just want to, that was a good debate. Thank you, folks, very much. Um, now, I think where we were last time when we started this, the Councillor Hensby was on the board next uh, on the budget. Um, yes, Mr. I'm not yes. sure. Uh, I think, Councillor Hensby, you had proposed a. Uh, An amendment. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a specific amendment in the budget to, to uh, allocate uh, $180,000 from our contingency fund, I think it's Q421, to be uh, earmarked for the Muscle Rider 207 uh, Rural Transit Project. Um, that just to confirm 50-50% uh, cost sharing with the province for this initiative. Total project cost is $360,000. We got confirmation just last week from the province that they are prepared to fund it for this year. So this will allow the Muscle Rider at least put the order in for the buses and have them uh, you know, put in the manufacturing production line and hopefully deliver it by the end of the fiscal year and hopefully get the service up and ready uh, for next fiscal year in time for the uh, transit adjustments to the road 401. Okay, just on, is there a second for that? Second for the motion? I, I'd second David's motion. Councillor Stretch seconds. I just want to go to Jane or to Jacques and just get a sort of a lay of the land on this one uh, in terms of discussions with the province or thoughts. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, through to the councillor. So um, this is an item that we had funded in for the March budget at $200,000 uh, for the capital portion and it was coming out of the reserve. Uh, through the discussion in uh, May on the recast budget that had come out, uh, that funding had come out. Uh, as I look at attachment D in the, uh, the staff report, we still have $200,000 remaining in the, um, in the reserve. So we have booked the reserve uh, $200,000 for the rural transit, which was to be for the capital portion of that ask back in March. So with the uh, provincial government rather confirming their cost sharing, I believe that we do have money already set aside from the debates in March that would allow this project to go forward. So to clarify, do I need a formal motion or is that uh, staff consent, uh, consent of council? I just want to have it for the record that the money is allocated near March for the uh, 207 Rural transit projects. Uh, Mr. Mayor, through to the council, uh, provided that uh, budget committee approves the budget as presented and the withdrawal from reserves on attachment D, the two hundred thousand dollars is there for that project. Well, thank you very much You're for good. that clarification. I don't think my amendments required. Can I, can I get that confirmed from legal or from the clerk's office? Okay, so you're withdrawing the motion, Councillor. I just want to make sure if I withdraw it that I'm not. I just want to make sure the money is still there, according to the legal and, and the clerk's office. You know, uh, I just want to make sure that, that I don't want to make sure I'm not missing any procedural matters here. Okay, that's all. Okay. And my, listen, I always operate by the view that once Jane speaks, legal doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> I'll John, second that. Right? <laughs> Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor, is a talk here. Jane and I are both aligned on this, so Councillor. Jane is right. If the if council approves the budget as uh, you know the the details around Appendix D, then this is a done deal. Um, no matter what the clerk or Mr. Trace happens to happens to offer. <laughs> Sorry, John. <laughs> okay. 
John, how you feeling? Far be it for me to disagree with my CAO and CFO. <laughs> and mayor and councillors. Okay. Uh, yes. Thank you. Sir. David, you're good? Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to Councillor Russell. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to move an amendment to allocate $187,000 to keep the customer service center at Acadia School open and to fund this from the general contingency reserve uh, Q421 for the 2020-21 uh, fiscal year. It's Tim and I'll second. Thank you. Um, basically, we were having a, a discussion a while ago, and this is one of the items that uh, we saw in the operating uh, in the operating budget that was going to be looked at at being moved out. Um, the customer service center at Acadia School, the one at Scotia Square, and then also reducing the um, after hour support for 311. So we requested the uh, report that came back from uh, Jerry Blackwood uh, showing how much utilization each of those had. And what we saw in that report was rather interesting. When we look at the after hour support, um, and I am looking at uh, page three of the report for August 2019. In the open time of 311, we had 35,000 calls. And in the closed hours of the report, we had 612 calls. So I can certainly see the justification for moving that to um, a call center and, and not continuing with that. We have previously talked about uh, the reconfiguration of Scotia Square and moving the customer service centers there and, and what we would be doing with the budget. But when we look at Acadia School, what we see, and I'm looking at uh, uh, 2018 here, we had nearly 20% of the people who went to a walk-in show up at the Acadia School here in Sackville. And 16,000 transactions were made there for a grand total of almost $12 million. So what we see is a huge interest in people who want to uh, pay their bills at some place other than what we're left with is Bears Road and Alderney Landing. So it is the only customer service center that would be open outside of the regional center. So for those people from Hammonds Plains or from Fall River or from anywhere in the Sackvilles or Bedford who don't want to drive in town and don't want to have to incur that, they have another option here in Lower Sackville. And so this is why I'm looking for um, the $187,000 from that reserve to keep that open for this year and then hoping it would uh, just be folded into the regular budget for future years. So with that, uh, I'd look for any further comments. Thank you. Any comments on that, uh, colleagues? Ready for the question? So, Mr. Mayor. Question. Go ahead, uh, John. Just just confirming with uh, Ms. Fraser, but uh, this would be a rescission. This is a partial, uh, it's, uh, let me rephrase that. Um, this would go against the decision to finalize the expenditures as directed by council on May 29th. So you need two thirds vote to now, uh, re to, to do that over as it were. Here at committee, here at committee. Here. Okay, John, thank you. It needs two thirds vote to, to look at it or on the, on the vote itself, John? On the Just vote on itself? The vote itself. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, okay, so just for first thing, I thought I heard it was Councillor Outhead who seconded that as well. Um, Councillor Mancini? Yes, it was. Thank you. Councillor Mancini? So I have some questions for staff on this, uh, Mr. Mayor, if I can uh, try to understand. Uh, we had so many meetings leading up to this and so many conversations. So is Jerry on the line to speak to this? Jerry Blackwood, are you with us? Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor, I'm here. Jerry, good to see you. How are you doing? Doing great. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Councilor Mancini. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, hi, Jerry. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, so I'm trying to understand this. 
the decision to close down Scotia Square and the uh, customer service center uh, at Acadia uh, in, in uh, Council Russell's area was how much of that was a financial decision versus how much of that is simply an efficiency decision where, you know, would you have made that decision uh, in closing down either one of those? Um, if we weren't resetting the uh, the budget as we were working on, uh, I'm just trying to understand the and how busy was Acadia versus Scotia Square? Those are my two couple of questions, Jerry. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'll I'll a answer the first uh, the first part of that question, uh, Councillor <clears throat> um, Mr. Mayor Jerry Blackwood, Director of Corporate Customer Services. So. Um, for 2019, Acadia School was 13% of total transactions of the four storefronts, and Scotia Square was 29% uh, of uh, total transactions for the storefronts. To your question <clears throat> with regards to is this is this about efficiency? Is it a financial decision? I would say I would say it's a little bit of both. Um, I think the briefing note uh, you know speaks for itself. Uh, a lot of the decision is predicated on uh, council is making millions of dollars in investments in terms of technology, uh, the permitting and licensing system, transit fare management, SAP, um, uh, parking technology. These uh, technologies will enable self-service. They'll enable more online opportunities. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of of, of the two centers, um, you know, it's about changing behaviors. Um, you know, now is a good a good time, we believe, to to take this step by, I believe I was asked at the last council meeting, you know, would this be brought forward in another year or two? And I, and I would say yes, as, as these new technology platforms roll out. So I think now is a good time to start doing that. Um, it's a lot about change, kind of changing behaviors, and you know, we 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 talked about, for example, the IMP plan is about changing behaviors, moving people to other channels of transportation, being tra uh, transit, walking, biking. Uh, this is about uh, changing behaviors and and certainly um, promoting our online channels for for customer service. And, uh, you know, we will still have a, a uh, walk up compliment uh, uh, at our Bayers and at our uh, Alderney uh, storefront, which are, you know, on, um, you know, transit uh, trunk routes. Uh, Alderney is very accessible from downtown from the, uh, the Halifax Ferry Terminal. Um, so, you know, we, we feel it's a little bit of both. It's a, it's a bit of efficiency. It's a bit of uh, financial and uh, you know certainly about uh, changing behaviors and and respecting council's investments in in online uh, and digital uh, technology and thank you for that jerry i guess you know and, I, and i'm all for efficiencies and utilizing the technology uh, presently and as we move forward i guess the challenge is you know and i consider think of a councillor russell some of his residents that maybe you know of the age of our mayor and older you know, that's pretty old you know uh, in their acceptance of uh, the technology and uh, it's Mrs. Jones and that's uh, the, the, the how do we help the Mrs. Jones that's not that's easier for you and I but not so much for Mrs. Jones so my last question Mr. Mayor may very quickly so maybe this is from Ms. Frazier you know if this motion that's in front of us for an additional 187k does that impact uh, uh, what we're trying to accomplish today and improve the budget does that change anything dramatically uh, and and you know tax rate or whatever it might be does that have any any change in what we're trying to accomplish today uh, mr mayor through you to the uh, to the councillor so it doesn't impact the t uh, the tax rate what it does is it eats into um, our reserves and some of the uh, you know the conversations that we've been having over the last number of weeks uh, around the recast budget is that we really don't know what's coming down the the road um, at, for us as far as october tax bills so we have some uh, you know we're still about 11 percent shy about 40. $40 million uh, taxes that haven't been collected yet. And I don't think we're going to get that given the date. Um, so so we're, every one of these decisions so eats into um, to our safety net or our cushion, um, if you will. So that would be my question. It does not impact the, uh, the 1.4% increase. 
Thank you, Ms. Frazier. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councilor Mason. Looking forward to the council meeting starting soon, Mr. Mayor. Um, <laughs> so for me, uh, Jer my question is going to be for Jerry. What are the percentages? And he just said them. So uh, the Scotia Square is 29%, I think you said, and, and Acadia is 16. You know, we're trying to find ways to save money, reduce exposure for uh, COVID and to try and uh, to COVID for our staff. Uh, you know, only have to put plexiglass in one location and trying to uh, change those behaviors that Jerry was talking about. Uh, I can't support the motion on the floor right now. Uh, to me, the right place to put it isn't Scotia Square. That's why I didn't say a word about it during budget. Uh, Alderney, where we own the parking lot, has 30 minute parking for people who are visiting uh, to, to access these, uh, this site and longer parking if you go in, in underground or into the into the uh, Alderney Gate uh, surface parking lot. Uh, it's kind of the, the single location we should keep open temporarily for now, ultimately. I would like to see as much as possible all of these closed and, and all that moved to online. Uh, you know, that's why we're spending all this money on libraries with computers to make sure everybody has access to the online services, whether they have a computer at home or not. So I won't be able to support the motion. Uh, sorry, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nickel. And moving to online, that's what I was told 10 years ago when staff presented. It was a different director, Jerry, it wasn't you. But I was told that we were modernizing and everybody was doing their business online. So the customer service center at Cole Harbor Place was to close. It has been closed for 10 years. And it wasn't Mrs. Jones, it was Mr. Jones that was mostly upset. <laughs> and there was a lot of pushback. Councillor uh, Karsten will recall that because it was, it, you know, it served a larger area. A lot of people were upset because mostly they were had to go to Alderney now where there was no parking. So it's all about the parking. But that being said, I was told there was a plan in place to direct more and more people to online business. And this, so like it's, it's easy to see like the conversations we're having today, how one business unit under a certain director would have certain priorities. And then over the years, it kind of, you know, we don't see as much action contributed to that. So, you know, I, I can't support this because basically when I bought into the whole idea of having more people go to doing business online, you know, 10 years ago, that's a long time. So, you know, I, I, I would so hope that what Jerry was trying to do was sort of pick up the ball from that 10 years ago and sort of continue on that with that practice. But so I, I can't support this, especially at this late juncture of the budget. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor K. Arston. Karsten. Thank you so very much, Mr. Mayor. Just to follow up on Councillor Nickel, she described a very uh, vivid uh, description of what happened then. Uh, left out a little minor thing, Councillor Nickel, and that would be that a week later, people adjusted, moved on, and it was no longer an issue. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor so Stretch. I, so I won't be supporting the motion on the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stretch. Thank you very much, Your Worship. And uh, unfortunately, I'll not uh, be able to support this either. I think we've got to uh, got to bring this whole budget uh, uh, to a close very soon. I do have a question, though. We talk about online uh, services, and, and that's fine. I'm adjusting like everybody else. But in order to pay online, for the most part, uh, a lot of people use credit cards. And I raised this before, and we were told that, yes, you can use your credit card to pay your tax bill, for example. But uh, now I understand there's a premium to do that, and that kind of bothers me. I uh, I pay the credit card company already enough premium and interest if I don't make the, uh, uh, the full balance. Why do we charge a premium above and beyond for the convenience and for asking people to do this on computer, Your Worship? Uh, Mr. Mr. Mayor, I can answer that question for you. So it's actually, it's the, um, if you use your credit card to pay your taxes, it comes through a company called Plastique and they're the ones that actually charge the fee. It is not HRM that charges the fee uh, when you pay your taxes online. All right, then uh, let me simplify the question. Why don't we just accept as a body uh, the payment by credit cards without going through a uh, external source like any other company or a jurisdiction does? Uh, Mr. 
Mr. Mayor, through you to the councillor. So we are moving that way. Um, some of it is wrapped up in PCI compliance, which means that we don't have the security in our system to accept uh, some of that. And that's the reason, quite frankly, why the online services um, are not advancing as, as quickly as possible. The other thing is some of the interfaces that we have um, through Hanson into SAP. Um, so with the SAP Business Transformation Project for financials, HR procurement um, and revenue, we'll be able to uh, to vastly improve the uh, the service that we provide. And I sincerely hope it is not 10 years to get that done. <laughs> Jane, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Your Worship. I, I look forward to the day when we can uh, take payments online by credit card uh, without additional fees. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Russell. Thank you very much. And I appreciate the comments and the consideration for this motion. Um, there are two points that I would like to address. One of them is in relation to the parking. Um, yeah, there is a, an absolute fee for parking downtown at Scotia Square and at Alderney, Alderney Gate. Um, less of a fee at uh, Bears Road. There is no fee for parking in uh, at the Acadia School in Sackville. The second thing is about changing the behavior and moving to online. And this is one of the things that I saw a lot in the election back in October, where people were saying, isn't it great that we are able to vote online? And we had 100% um, use of uh, online voting in, in that election. And when I spoke with a number of people around the community, that meant that they were not going to vote. Uh, they were not going to, uh, they did not have a computer and they were not going to go to uh, go to some place where someone could watch them vote. They didn't know how to use a computer, so they would need to get help with it. Uh, to Councillor Stretch's point, yes, you can pay online using a credit card. Some people don't have the option to use a credit card, and so they would have to go to uh, one of these places. So I want to make sure that we are considering all of those and allowing every opportunity possible for people to pay the taxes where they are for us to be seen as a community of, of working with as many people as possible where they are either in a state of life, a state of finances or uh, geographically. So this is why I would appreciate your consideration for having this motion so that people could uh, pay their taxes without, uh, sorry, closer to home in a lot of cases. So thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Mayor, if I if I could just add a, a quick comment to um, Councillor Russell's um, uh, comments there, um, with respect to taxes, uh, uh, I think most of our banks, like uh, you can walk into a bank and and uh, if you want to pay your taxes in person, so uh, any of the banks in 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 your district would would accept uh, payments in person by. Uh, uh, through through that channel as well, so uh, you know, and that and that's a popular uh, channel for for some people that that pay their monthly bills or pay their tax bill at, at their uh, local uh, bank. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Okay, colleagues, seeing nobody else, um, ready for the question, Cheryl. Councillor Stretch. Against the motion. Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Councillor Karsten? Against the motion. Councillor Nichols? No. Councillor Austin? Against. Councillor Mancini? Against the motion. Councillor Mason? Against the motion. Councillor Smith? Again. Councillor Cleary? No. Councillor Walker. Oh, against. Councillor Adams. Against. Councillor Sarowski. Against. Councillor Whitman. Against. Deputy Mayor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Outhead. Voting yes to reduce that car traffic in the urban areas. That That is a yes, Councillor Outhead? That would be a strong yes. 
Mayor Savage. So that's four in favor and three, 13 against. Hit mute. I, uh, I voted. Uh, am I on? I'm mute. OK, the motion is defeated. Thank you very much. Um, colleagues. Anything else on budget? Question on the motion. Question. Ready for the question on the motion as amended? More than ready. Uh, should we take a few minutes motion? to sure, colleagues, or should we go ahead and vote? Vote. Councilor Stretch. That isn't even funny. Councilor Stretch. Richard, you are sharing your screen. Uh, I can't. Are we on the main motion? Yes. Yeah. Budget imagine. motion. The next button. Uh, to the right. There's next something. one over, Richard. There's something next wrong. Over. To yeah. the right, Richard. There you go. Scientists, they can't handle technology. What was that discussion we just had about technology? <laughs> Lindell, can you help? Lindell's the expert to deal with seniors and technology. <laughs> Stop volunteering me. <laughs> Voting for the motion. Councillor Hensby. Affirmative, and now you can take the bus to the beach. Councillor Carston. For the motion. Councillor Nickel. Yes. Councillor Austin. Yes. Councillor Mancini. For the motion. Councillor Mason. For the motion. Councillor Smith. For the motion. Councillor Cleary. Yes. Councillor Walker. For. Councillor Adams. For. Councillor Zorowski. For technology included. Councillor Whitman. I'm voting against the budget. Deputy Mayor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Outfit. Voting for the motion. And Mayor Savage. For the motion. 16-1. That motion passes. Well, colleagues, uh, Cheryl, that brings us to the end of budget, Committee of the Whole and Budget. Uh, we still have a few things left to do on our council agenda, so um, maybe what we'll do, according to my watch, it's uh, almost 10 to 3. Uh, shall we come back at 10 past 3, colleagues, and uh, begin council, and then uh, finish at uh, 20 past 3? Okay, so sure. we're back at uh, 10, 10 minutes past 3 o'clock, colleagues. Thank you very much. That was good debate. I'm in this uh, room, right, Mr. Mayor? We stay in this, no, uh, yeah, are we yeah. in the committee of the whole? Do we stay in the committee of the whole or do we go to where? Laura, do As we stay we, here? Motion to adjourn so the Mr. Mayor, it's Laura. Yes, you, you stay in this meeting. In this okay. meeting, yeah, thank you. Motion to adjourn the budget.
So, Micah, you have control today? Yes, they are. Uh... So I will just remind everyone that we are still live. Uh, so we'd ask that uh, you have your mics on mute uh, until we resume the meeting. Oh, come on, Laura. No, Laura? Uh, yes, Mr. Rare. How are we doing? We got a good uh, turnout? Uh, we do. We are just waiting uh, for one member of counselor, uh, council, Councillor Mancini, um, but you can get started if you wish. What are we at? Uh, 310. Okay, I think maybe we'll get going, colleagues. Okay. Um, All good. Just waiting to go live. Okay, colleagues, so it is June the 9th. We've had our committee of the whole on budget. Um, and if you keep in track, that was committee of the whole number 627 of the year uh, that we have done now in three different incarnations. I'm keeping track for you. Uh, I'm gonna call this meeting to order. This is our regular agenda. Uh, I'll call the meeting to order. There are no minutes to approve. Under approval of the order of business, uh, Deputy Mayor. Yes, thank you. Um, 
So I would like to uh, add the ratification of the budget to the agenda. Uh, and uh, just checking with the uh, the clerk's office, do you want me to uh, read all of the uh, all the verbiage that has been sent my way? I don't Every think deputy mayor that. has asked that in the past, and the answer is yes. Yes, I think we need to. We just need to add it to the agenda for now, and then read the. Okay. Uh, correct, Cheryl. Yes. Yes. It's just, and you may see item ten is a different item from a different budget meeting, but we require a hundred percent to add an item to a special agenda. So I'm going to ask you to. It was there was a second for for the deputy mayor? Councilor Mr. Mayor Bill. Councilor Parson. Councilor Parson. Same thing. Uh, OK, so uh, if you'll just take your micro, put your microphones on live, I'm going to ask for consent to add that to the agenda. A uh, quick question about procedure, if you don't mind. Is that a unanimous vote of everybody present or of all 17? All 17. Um, so if you take yourselves, take yourselves off mute, and I'm going to ask for approval to add that to the agenda. Everybody agree. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay, agree. that'll be added to the agenda. Madam Clerk, anything else to be? Yes. Councillor Austin. Councillor Austin. Uh, Mr. Mayor, it is Laura. Uh, Councillor Austin is uh, no longer in the meeting, um, so we're just going to look into that for you. Okay, so in that case, uh, Councillor Austin is in to defer item 8.1 to the June 23rd Special Council. Colleagues, did you hear that? Councillor Austin, I think, sent a note out asking to defer um, yes, yes. 8.1, is everybody okay with that? Agreed. Yes. Agreed. Agreed. Yes. Agreed. That will be deferred till the next meeting. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, may Mayor. I? The other matter is, is if we'd like to deal with 10.1 uh, when we deal with the ratification of the budget at the same time. And I would suggest that you deal with the ratification of the budget immediately following the approval of the order of business. You should really call that uh, feedback, you know. What am I calling it? Kickback. Oh, kickback, yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> Probably a 1970s term. Um, because all the feedback I get from you guys is universally I positive. knew you were going to say that. <laughs> so I'm going to suggest then that we will ratify the committee of the whole of today right after we do uh which one Cheryl are you suggesting so as soon as we approve the agenda we'll look at that and we'll do 10.1 at the same time okay. okay I thought you said you wanted to do it at the same time yes. yeah so 10.1 should move up on the agenda? To the same place. Yes. That's, that will be our plan then. We will move 10.1 up and uh, at the same time we will ratify the discussions of earlier today. Everybody okay with that? Okay. Um, so does somebody want to move the approval? I'll move the approval of the order of business. Second, Second Kavarowski. Mr. Mayor, you're muted. Thank you. Councillor Nichols, seconded by Councillor Zarowski, moves the order of business as amended. Uh, we can vote for that just by voice. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Barbara. Aye. Opposed? That is done. Colleagues, let's look at the consent agenda. Councillor no Mason questions. moves the Maybe consent agenda. Councillor Mason by moves Cleary. the consent. Seconded by Councillor Cleary. Let me just read those items. 9.1.2 is the administrative order respecting grants to business improvement districts. And 9.1.3 is the Bedford West capital cost contribution review. It's been moved that they be passed by consent. Question. 
I was hoping to really talk about how much I love the West Bedford vision there, but I guess I can live with you, uh, Pat, unanimously. Uh. Well, I, I think you just have spoken on it. Ready for the question? Question. Question. Cheryl? Sure. Councillor Stretch. For the motion. Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Uh, Councillor Carson. For the motion. Councillor Nickel. Yes. Councillor Austin. Councillor Mancini. For the motion. Councillor Mason. For the motion. Councillor Smith. For the motion. Councillor Cleary. Yes. Councillor Walker. For. Councillor Adams. For. Councillor Zorowski. For the motion. Councillor Whitman. For. Deputy Mayor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Outhit. Oh, I suppose so. <laughs> and Mayor Savage. I vote for the motion. That motion. Uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, it's uh, Councillor Austin. Uh, I've just recovered from a computer crash. What are we actually voting on? We just are voting on the approval of the consent agenda. Oh, yes, absolutely. I vote yes. And we have moved your order of business to June the 23rd. Thank you, colleagues. Although I see John, uh, John uh, Trace. I'm sorry, did you want to speak on that, John? If I may, Mr. Mayor, I just I just wanted to remind members of council that our rules uh, require uh, notice if you uh, through the clerk's office if you intend to move a motion on a, on an item like that, just so that there is no surprises for members of council and we can circulate that ahead of the next meeting if that's the intent. If if you mean you mean if councillor Austin intends to move a motion, yeah, not to so defer. Any other member of council, they should, they should circulate that through the clerk's office ahead of time so that members will understand what's coming. Okay. Councillor Austin, you good? I'm good, and that's part of why I wanted to delay for a week to have some discussions with staff, or at least two weeks, I guess it is. Thank you. So, colleagues, we're going to move then to uh, the approval of the two items coming from Committee of the Whole, the one from today and the one that's listed as item 10.1. So, um, Deputy Mayor, on the mm -hmm. budget today. All right. Uh, so uh, I move that, uh, stop me if I've got this wrong, I move that the operating budget in the amount of $955,255,300 gross expenditures, which includes $787,055,300 in municipal expenditures, including the reserve withdrawal specified in the operating and project budget, $753,640,300 in property tax revenues, including area rate revenues, and $201,615,000 in other revenues be approved. B, the capital budget in the amount of $149,826,333 be approved. C, the general rates of taxation on residential and resource property bits be set at uh, 1. Uh, 0.67 for the urban rate, 0.637 for the suburban rate, and 0.637 for the rural rate per $100 of taxable <laughs> assessment. D, the general rates of taxation on commercial property be set at $3 for the urban rate, $3 for the suburban rate, and $2.658 and, uh, for the rural rate per $100 of taxable assessment. E, that the Halifax Transit Annual Service Plan and the tax rates associated with the transit taxation be set at 0 0.047 for the regional transportation tax rate, 0 0.098 for the local transit tax rate per $100 of taxable assessment. F, the boundaries of the urban, suburban, and rural areas are delineated in attachment A, the tax area map, 
The boundary of the regional transportation area includes all properties within communities included within attachment B, the regional transportation area, and the boundary for the local transit area includes all properties within one kilometer walking distance of any HRM transit stop. G, fire protection rates shall be set at the rate of 0.014 per $100 for all residential and resource assessment and at 0.040 per $100 of the commercial assessment for properties which are within 1,200 feet of a hydrant that is designed and operated for public fire protection purposes. H, the provincial area rate for mandatory education on residential and resource property but be set at the rate of 0 0.306 and at a rate of 0 0.311 for all commercial assessment. I, the provincial area rate for property valuation services on residential and resource property be set at the rate of 0 0.016 and at a rate of 0 0.009 for all commercial assessment. J, the provincial area rate for correction services on residential and resource property be set at the rate of 0 0.015 and at a rate of 0 0.007 for all commercial assessment. K, the provincial area rate for Metro Regional Housing Authority on residential and resource property be set at the rate of 0 0.007 and the rate of 0 0.008 for all commercial assessment. L, Supplementary education under Section 80 of the Halifax Regional Municipality Charter shall be set at the rate of 0 0.023 per $100 of the residential and resource assessment and at 0 0.066 per $100 of the commercial assessment. M, the final tax bills will, be, will become due on Friday, October 30th, 2020. N, the interest rate on the special reserve funds designated as requiring interest under Section 121.2 of the Halifax Charter, be set at the rate of return on funds invested by HRM for the period of April 1st, 2020 to March 31st, 2021. O, the, in, the interest rate on all reserves, except for those identified in N above, will be set at the, re the rate rather of return on funds invested by HRM for the period April 1st, 2020 to March 31st, 2021. P, Withdrawals from reserves, capital and operating, in the amount of $111,860,100 are approved as detailed in Attachment D, Schedule of Withdrawals from Reserves 2020-21. Q, multi-year projects are approved in the amount of $241,984,300 from 2020-21 to 2024-25 found in the schedule of multi-year projects in attachment C are approved and are the schedule of area tax rates attachment E and schedule of budgeted expenditures and revenues for the 2021 20, or 2020 rather 21 area rate services attachment A uh, attachment F rather are approved so end of the lesson second, second councilor nickel Second by Councillor Nickel. Are we ready for the question, colleagues? I have no words left. Question. Yeah. Yeah. That, but let's go to the question. Councillor Stretch. For the motion. Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. <clears throat> Councillor Kirsten. For the motion. Councillor Nickel. Yes. Councillor Austin. Yes. Councillor Mancini. Uh, Councillor Mancini. Yes. Councillor Mason. For the motion. Councillor Smith. For the motion. Councillor Cleary. Yes. Councillor Walker. Or. Councillor Adams. For. Councillor Sarowski. For the motion. Councillor Whitman. No. Deputy Mayor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. 
Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Outhill. Voting yes. And Mayor Savage. Yes, for the motion. 16-1. For the motion carries. So we'll do 10.1 at the same time then. Uh, colleagues, who wants to take that one? Mr. Mayor, if I may. Go ahead, John. If I could just confirm for the record, Councillors Austin and Mancini were not uh, on the meeting for the approval of the added item to the agenda. We need 100% of the councillors to agree. So I'm, I just want to confirm that they were agreeable. I know they voted in favor, but for the record in, in going ahead with this. Councillor Austin and Mancini, are you in favor of adding the item to the agenda that you just approved? Yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't that cause confusion if I said no? No. Uh, yes. You. Yes. Okay. Thank you, John, for uh, putting us in a sticky situation and getting us out. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, item 10.1. Mr. Mayor, it's Councillor Cleary. Do you want me to move that? Please. <clears throat> So 10.1, I move that Halifax Regional Council 1 endorse the capital projects and attachments A and B of the staff report dated May 21st, 2020, as well as the Halifax Regional Water Commission shovel ready projects attached to the staff report dated May 21st, 2020 for the potential infrastructure funding and two, direct the Chief Administrative Officer to submit these projects for funding in the event of a federal and or federal provincial infrastructure program is established. Councilor Nichols seconds. Councilor Nichols second. Ready for the question, colleagues? Question. Councillor Stretch. For the motion. Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Uh, Councillor Carsten. For the motion. Councillor Nichols. Yes. Councillor Austin. In favor. Councillor Mancini. For the motion. Councillor Mason. For the motion. Councillor Smith. For the motion. Councillor Cleary. Yes. Councillor Walker. For. Councillor Adams. For. Councillor Zareski. For the motion. Councillor Whitman. No. Councillor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Arte. Yes. Mayor Savage. For the motion. 61. Motion Thank you, Councillor Cleary and uh, Nickel. We'll go back in our agenda to um, calls for declaration of conflict of interest, colleagues. There is no deferred business. Uh, Correspondence. I think we received correspondence since the last uh, council meeting. Uh, Madam Clerk. Correspondence. We have correspondence on items 9.12 and 9.23. Three. Thank you. Petitions, colleagues. Uh, information item brought forward will be at our next meeting. Councillor Austin we will move to reports uh, 9.1.1 uh, Dutch Village Road. Complete streets functional uh, plan. Uh, who is this? Is this Councillor Walker? Or Walker. Who? Councillor Walker. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. The Halifax Regional Council wants to spend the rules of procedure under Schedule 7. The Transportation Standing Committee terms of reference and Administrative Order 1, the procedures of Council for Administrative Order. 2, direct the Chief Administrative Officer to proceed with the detailed design of Dutch Village Road between Alma Crescent, Supreme Court, and Joseph Howe Drive, Baird Road, as described in the discussion section of the staff report dated January 24, 2020. And three, direct the Chief Administrative Officer to consider the addition of streetscaping elements such as trees, benches, bicycle racks, waste receptacles, 
potential other elements to beautify the corridor during detailed design, and if included, ensure the corridor is maintained as an enhanced maintenance area. I shall Second, move. Councillor Cleary. Seconded by Councillor Cleary. Councillor Walker. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, it has been a long time coming, approximately 20 years, so don't give up on any project because it could come at any time. With this plan, it's going to totally redo to Otello's Road. Is everybody happy? No, because some of the mom and pop businesses think that it will affect their business, and that is yet to be seen. It will have sidewalks on both sides, bike lanes on both sides, parallel parking, a new entrance to shoppers, and the rapid flashing crosswalk lights at all the crosswalks. So it's a big improvement to the area and we've waited a long time. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Ready for the question, colleagues? Question. Councillor Stretch. For the motion. Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Councillor Kirsten. Councillor Nickel. Yes. Councillor Austin. In favor. Councillor Mancini. In favor of the motion. Councillor Mason. In favor. Councillor Smith. Yes. Councillor Cleary. Yes. Councillor Walker. Four. Councillor Adams. Four. Councillor Sarowski. Or the motion. Councillor Whitman. Yes. Deputy Mayor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Oathey? Yes. Mayor Savage? Yes. That motion carries. Thank you, Councillor Walker. Colleagues, we approved 9.1.2 by consent, passed it by consent, uh, respecting grants to business improvement districts. 9.1.3 Bedford West Cap Cost Contribution Review as well by consent. 9.14 Recommendations to the Current Provincial Aid to Municipality program. Mr. Mayor, if I may. Councillor Hensby. Thank you very much. I'll uh, move the recommendation. Uh, the Health Act Regional Council 1 suspend the rules and procedures under Schedule 7 of the Transportation Standing Committee terms to reference under Administrative Order 1, the procedures of Council Administrative Order, and 2, uh, direct the Chief Administrative Officer to prepare the necessary amendments to bylaw S-400 to implement option one as the outlined uh, discussion section of the staff report dated February 25th, 2020, as the preferred approach for cost sharing with the province and abutters on the paving of provincially owned village and subdivision streets. Second. Second by who is it? Zorowski. Zorowski, thank you, Richard. Uh, Councillor Hensby, anything on it? Well, Mr. Mayor, this is a long time coming to see some equity finally being brought to our paving program for urban and rural residents. Uh, this is, will mirror what we currently have in our suburban and urban areas. And uh, hopefully in the future, when we have our discussions with the province, we can have a more congenial and more timely discussion of paving of roads and trying to, when they're doing their capital projects in certain areas, we can probably um, supplement that with local paving of gravel streets. Uh, which will help with the, uh, keeping the cost down for the mobilization of equipment plus the delivery of asphalt and gravels. So I'm very pleased to see this report finally here. Uh, there's probably one person out there I want to say a big thank you to would be Ann Reed of many years ago. She'd been working on discussions of uh, LICs and province and, uh, and upgrading uh, gravel roads. And I bet she's very happy to hear this finally come to play today because uh, she's been advocating this type of approach for some time now. And uh, I just want to say thanks, Anne, and thank to David Hoobly and all the folks over there in our transportation design group uh, for this spawning coming forward today. And hopefully we'll move forward collectively in the future. The only thing I hope for in the future is I hope the province has enough money in their budget for them to initiate the, the paving of the, of, the, of the subdivision streets and we can partner with them. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Cleary. Just a quick question um, for staff. So when I looked at the different options that were available uh, for this treatment, um, option one obviously has Halifax uh, as a municipality uh, ponying up more money. Uh, option two, so it says here, option two, uh, just basically let Nova Scotia Transportation Infrastructure Renewal pick the roads, pay for everything. Um, benefits were significantly reduced HR and staff time. HRM uh, would be required to take over ownership of paved J-class roads. So in option two, it says that we would end up taking over the roads if they paid for them, but option one doesn't speak to ownership. So could I just have some clarification for option one? If under the this, this scenario, do we end up taking ownership of these roads once they're paved? Okay, who do we have? Dave Pupil, maybe, or? Yes, Mr. Ch <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, can you hear me okay? We got you, David, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, sir. With Dave Hubley with Project Planning and Design Services through to the councillor. No, under option one, the province would still own and maintain the, those J-class roads. So the difference is kind <clears throat> of in the upfront cost versus the maintenance cost then. I guess you would you would look at it that way that if, if they pay for the road paving and then we end up owning the road, we're then, it's incumbent upon us to clear it and maintain it, patch it, repave it. So is there a significant cost savings over the long run? To go with option one where they continue to maintain them? Uh, Mr. Mayor, through the councillor, I, I would say yes. Um, if, if we take that ownership to your point, we're going to be maintaining them, uh, upgrading them through capital. <clears throat> Excuse me, they'll become part of our inventory. Under option one, as I said, they'll continue to own it. So we would be um, uh, providing 16% of the cost to, to pave it, but then beyond that, um, uh, the province would still be responsible to maintain it. And does it, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to Mr. Hubley, does it um, change the number of roads that would end up getting paved under year under this program, or would they roughly be the same? Uh, Mr. Mayor, through the council, that's <laughs> difficult to say. We would, I guess what would change with option one uh, from the current process is that because it would now be uh, vetted through our capital budget process, we would have to look at the at the risk and the service impacts to that and, and, and rate it against all the other accounts. So I suppose when in times when the budget is constrained, we you know, may not make it uh, to the program. Uh, but if it does, then we would uh, create a list, provide that to the province, which typically happens in October of each year. And then there's the subsequent March period when the uh, province has their budget approved, that's when they set their uh, their allocation. So, yeah, at the end of the day, it's going to be the, the province's call, and it'll be based on the funding that they have allocated for this program. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Hubert. Thank you, Councillor. Seeing no other questions, ready for the question, colleagues? Councillor Stretch. For the motion. Councillor Henske. Affirmative. Councillor Kirsten. Councillor Nichols. Yes. Councillor Austin. In favor. Councillor Minches. In favor of the motion. I don't know who you meant, Cheryl. It's okay. In favor of the motion. Councillor Mason. In favor. Councillor Smith. In favor. Councillor Cleary. Yes. Councillor Walker. Four. Councillor Adams. Four. Councillor Zerowski. For the motion. Councillor Whiffman. Yes. Deputy Mayor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Alton. Yes. Mayor Savage. For the motion, that motion passes. Thank you, Councilor Hensby. We'll move to 9.1.5, which is bonus zoning agreement 1872 to 74 Brunswick Street. Uh, Councilor Mason, uh, perhaps? 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll take this one. I move that Halifax Regional Council authorize the mayor and clerk to execute the incentive bonus zoning agreement as provided in attachment C of the staff report dated April 30th, 2020 for a 12 story hotel at 1872-1874 Brunswick Street, Halifax. Second, Whitman. Seconded by Councillor Whitman, Councillor Mason. So I have some questions for staff. Uh, this was an interesting and difficult uh, uh, public benefit agreement for me to wrap my head around. And I admit I haven't had a chance to talk to staff about it uh, because we've been so busy with other things that, that we've spent most of today debating. Um, the public benefit uh, to me, the piece is, uh, are we really saying that that this interior second floor space that's going to be a gallery is uh, that that we're going to have development officers for years and decades making sure that that space is being used uh, to a public benefit? Uh, how are we going to guarantee access to the public, I guess, when it's, it's clearly in the center of the hotel? Um, and one of the things that was a real red flag as I read it is it's talking about an Aboriginal art gallery, which is a word uh, used to describe uh, First Nations people and Indigenous people that simply has fallen out of favor the last 10 or 15 years. So that led me to wonder whether or not uh, the proponents had actually talked to anybody in the First Nations community here in Halifax and whether they have the support. And I know from uh, talking to some folks in that community uh, who lead some of the the leading organizations in Halifax that they have not had any communication about it. So, you know, that leads to the final question, which is who who would run it? Would be it wasn't clear to me the hotel is going to help pay for it, but are they are they going to fund a not for profit, or are they going to just run it as an operation of the hotel? H how does all that work? So I'd ask staff if they could come forward and kind of explain this stuff because it's all new to us. What do we have from staff? Uh, Andrew Faulkner, Principal Planner, Development Officer. All right, go ahead, sir. Yes, hello, Mr. Mayor and Councillors. Uh, I can't speak to how the uh, developer has uh, <clears throat> approached the, the community on this, but uh, if I sent, point your attention to attachment uh, B, which is the breakdown on the public benefit. This was provided by the developer. Uh, it's been reviewed and uh, supported by the uh, design review committee as well. The part of what they are doing, if we look on page three, which is the cost breakdown on this, is they are hiring a uh, on-site coordinator manager for administration of the gallery. Uh, this certainly shows a commitment to using it as far as, and that of course would be an ongoing yearly cost over and above this, this startup uh, estimated budget. Um, as far as monitoring goes, uh, I mean, there would be periodic check-ins on it, but it, it isn't the kind of thing that we wouldn't, that we would regularly investigate, let's say, or, or inspect to ensure that they're compliance. I suspect that the community itself, once this is established, is, is self, will be uh, self-monitoring in that sense and advising us if there's a, a violation. Well, I guess uh, this reminds me of when I used to sell sponsorships for uh, festivals and not-for-profits where you always had someone coming in offering a color photocopier you didn't need and you hadn't asked for uh, and wanting a $15,000 sponsorship package. I don't have enough information here in, in my opinion to go ahead. So I guess I would I would ask council to support a motion of deferral for a supplementary staff report to ask for information about how the gallery is going to operate, how the public is going to access it. Uh, will there be a cost associated to get in there? Who's going to decide what art hangs in, in, in those wall, on those walls? And uh, what kind of engagement with First Nations and Indigenous people uh, have they had and do they plan to have? Uh, because I think it's really important we know those things. I know it's only for $120,000 worth of value to get the bonus, but but I can't good conscience vote for this contract when I don't understand how it's going to function in, in the real world. So I'd ask for a, a seconder and support for Second, Council Second. Thank you, Council. Okay, so that was seconded by Nickel, was it? Councilor Nickel, did you second that? Yes. Thank you. So that's a motion to defer. Correct, uh, Councilor Mason? Yes, it is. And, and I guess uh, I, I really feel uh, I have growing unease about the public art offerings that we're, we're negotiating and accepting for the downtown plan. 
uh, we had similar concerns, some of us, with the uh, Hollis Bishop uh, proposal. It was a nice piece of art, but it, it didn't quite fit for some of us with, with public benefit. This one, I think, is even a step beyond that. So, so I would ask for a staff report so that we can have some clarity about exactly what we're voting for. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. So on the motion to defer, is there a discussion? Councillor Cleary on that? Uh, yes, Your Worship. Thank you very much. Um, I had uh, similar conversations and concerns as Councillor Mason did. Um, if it was just a, as a public benefit, we're going to have an art gallery. You know, OK, I get it. And with the details are provided, I, I could probably understand it. But what they're asking for and <laughs> Councillor Mason's point about Aboriginal uh, versus Indigenous, uh, you know, the First Nations, Inuit and Métis communities in, in Canada have been and I'll, I'll go back a little bit to the discussion we spent a lot of our morning on uh, and some of the afternoon uh, around, uh, you know, black, indigenous and, and peoples of color uh, within our communities. It's it's not good enough for someone to just kind of come forward with a plan and say, look, I got a public benefit. It's going to be an indigenous art gallery and not having communicated with a single indigenous person that we can find in, in Halifax about this. I appreciate the effort. But it's it's not it's not the way reconciliation or or any kind of uh, relationship with our indigenous communities. It's not that it's not how that should work. So if there was attached to this a report with endorsements from indigenous uh, groups or individuals in Halifax saying this is a great thing, we we love it. That would be very different. But there's nothing attached to this yet. And so, yes, to Councillor Mason's motion on all those other things, but specifically for me, that last thing he mentioned about engagement with the, the local Indigenous community, um, that is really key for us to understand what kind of benefit to the public are we talking about here and who is the public they're benefiting. So I will support Councillor Mason's motion for deferral in the supplementary report. Thank you. I just ask uh, staff uh, who would be doing this to report if it passes. Um, what are the implications of this, assuming that this passes? Uh, um, Mr. Mayor, um, this is Steve Higgins, manager of current planning. I, I'll uh, I'll try and field that one here. If you can let my camera catch up with uh, with my voice. There we go. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, so that that uh, that report will come from my desk, and uh, we will we'll seek to try and uh, and and flesh out the details of what is actually being proposed in terms of how they will operate. Well, we can respond to a few of those questions right now. Um, the uh, the the space will be available at any time. <coughs> excuse me. Uh, anytime the hotel is open, the operations of it will be dealt with by the a coordinator. Uh, for the gallery hired by the operators of the hotel. Um, and uh, at, at this point, we did not seek any more detail than that uh, because we believe that satisfied the requirement for the post bonus uh, 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 benefit. Uh, but uh, understanding council's request, uh, we'll certainly uh, uh, work with the developer to try and flesh out some of those details uh, in as much uh, as we have available at this time, noting that they they were sort of uh, at this point waiting to uh, complete this process before they would move on to the next stage, which would be fitting that place, uh, that, that space out. Uh, but uh, in understanding council's uh, interest, we, we will provide that report. It will come from my desk. All right. Thank you, Mr. Higgins. Nice to see you. Uh, Councilor Whitman. Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor Savage. I'm just wondering how long the uh, report will take because if we're trying to prove a value of $114,000, if the report takes any more than a month, it's going to cost this uh, project $114,000. So how long will the uh, report take to come back? Uh, some of that, I think, will be uh, contingent on on the uh, engage our ability to engage and get the answers we need from the developer. But uh, you know, preparing the report itself should be a relatively straightforward exercise. We'll do our best to try and contact those folks uh, tomorrow uh, to try and get that information as as quickly as we can, and, uh, and we'll bring it back to council at the first possible opportunity. Uh, so you know, assuming that the that the questions we will ask. Um, uh, they have answers available. I would expect we should be able to bring it back to council within the next two to three council meetings. 
Um, the the uh, the one uh, sort of wild card in that uh, in that question will be uh, whether or not they have engaged with anyone in the First Nations community. If they have not done so, uh, if we are going to wait for that to take place, obviously that'll uh, that'll add some time to the exercise. Yeah, thank you, uh, Stephen. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think in the interest of uh, reducing red tape and being a business friendly city, I'm not going to support the deferral. I think there's Lots of time once the project starts to prove $114,000 worth of uh, public benefits. So I think full speed ahead. I won't be supporting the deferral. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and if I may, Mr. Mayor, just just uh, one more uh, piece of clarification with respect to the ongoing monitoring of the uh, of the activity. Uh, the agreement does require uh, the developer to report to the municipality annually. Uh, as to the ongoing operations. So we would be looking to them to keep us updated on an annual basis. And we also are free at any any moment. The, the, uh, the agreement uh, also provides us capacity to inspect the property at any time on demand to be able to make sure that uh, what was provided for at the time of the permit is ongoing. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I feel like I'm living the Ken Monkman uh, lecture that I saw at uh, King's for the Alex Fountain Memorial Lecture, uh, where he talked about uh, his artwork as an Aboriginal man not being allowed to be hung by the uh, the uh, non-Aboriginal curator of Aboriginal art at the Royal Ontario Museum uh, for 45 minutes and, and, and how that influenced his process. And certainly, I don't think it's red tape to uh, understand uh, the actual implications of, of what we're being asked and, and to the ins and outs of the contract. So uh, I will ask Council to support this deferral and uh, and so that we can get some more answers and make sure that the First Nations and, and Indigenous community has been adequately consulted. Thank you. Thank you. Ready for the question uh, on the deferral, motion to defer. Just yes, one quick question. Uh, on no, the so current building that's there now, uh, would this development require an addition to the building or demolition of the current site? Uh, the question is Steve, Steve, right? uh, sorry, Councillor, I, I uh, had a bit of a bump there in my uh, my computer and missed your question. I'm just trying to call the building that's currently there now. This would be an addition on, uh, over and above the top of the current building and be a retrofit of the current building, or would the other building be demolished totally and then rebuilt from the ground up? Yeah, this is an entirely new structure. Thank you. Okay, let's have a vote on the motion to defer. Councillor Stretch. For the motion. Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Councillor Kirsten. Councillor Nickel. Yes. Councillor Austin. Uh, in favor. Councillor Mancini. In favor of the motion. Councillor Mason. For the motion. Councillor Smith. In favor. Councillor Cleary. Yes. Councillor Walker. Or. Councillor Adams. For. Councillor Sarowski. For the motion. Councillor Whitman. No to the deferral. Councillor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Outfit. Yes. And Mayor Savage. For the motion. The motion will carry. Thank you. Thank you, Count. Uh, thank you to uh, Mr. Parker and Mr. Higgins. Um, moving on, colleagues. 9.2.1. Um, I'll do that. Coming from Heritage Advisory Committee. Who would like to have that one? I will, Mr. Mayor. Dr. Local Councillor. Councillor Mason. I move that Halifax Regional Council 1 approve the substantial alteration of 1724 Granville Street, Halifax, known as the Acadian Recorder Building, as proposed in the community committee report dated June 3rd, 2020, and its attachments. Two, approve the substantial alteration of 1740 Granville Street, Halifax, known as the Kenny Davis Building, as proposed in the committee 
committee report dated June 3rd, 2020 and its attachments and give consideration that the contingency plans exist to ensure the structural integrity of the retention of the heritage facade of each building during construction of the parking garage and developers give some consideration to the incorporation of public art that is contextually sensitive, including the blank wall on Barrington Street and the developer must remain consistent with the plan shown in attaching E of the staff report dated March 1st, 2020, with particular attention to the depth of the heritage facade on the Granville Street elevation. I so move. Attacking Second. Second by Councillor Cleary. Councillor Mason on it. So this is a great day. I mean, we were facing potential demolition of the uh, uh, Kenny Dennis building, and then uh, even when it looked like it was going to be saved, the uh, uh, the the owners, the province, were talking about uh, knocking off the brick above the uh, the the granite facade, uh, and uh, the Acadian Recorder building had had been under threat for some time. And when you look at the proposal, I think this is the first time a lot of councillors have seen these plans and the renderings. And, uh, you know, uh, that is why there's that third bullet there in section three. The developer must uh, uh, be consistent with the depth of the heritage facade. So so when Mr. Lowen, when Louis showed me these plans some time ago, uh, he's especially proud of the fact that around all the heritage buildings, that there's going to be an eight or nine foot, he calls it a return or a recess before the new building fabric goes along and then and then comes back out. So when you're walking down the street, imagine where in back in the G7 they put in the roof and you can see the different history of the of the Kenny Dennis building. Uh, you will still be able to see the first eight or nine feet of that. That brick and that history will still be revealed. And same with uh, on, on both sides of that building and on the Acadian Recorder building. Uh, I think it's a very sensitive and appropriate heritage renovation. I also really like the uh, the white building evokes without being pastiche the uh, Burke's Tower that used to be there on the corner of Georgian and, and Barrington Street. Uh, so while it is a new building, I think it's entirely the, the massing and heights along Barrington Street are in keeping with the Barrington Heritage Conservation District. So uh, this is, uh, I think, the last empty and unconstructed site on uh, Barrington Street and the only remaining site after this to even need a renovation in the Heritage District will be uh, the Pacific Building uh, down uh, uh, at, at the other end uh, by the Maritime Center. So, uh, you know, this is a great thing for Halifax and for our first Heritage Conservation District and I'm really had, happy to see it moving forward. I, I support this motion. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Ready for the question, colleagues? Councillor Stretch. For the motion. Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Councillor Kirsten. Councillor Nickel. Yes. Councillor Austin. In favor. Councillor Mancini. For the motion. Councillor Mason. For the motion. Councillor Smith. For the motion. Councillor Cleary. Yes. Councillor Walker. For. Councillor Adams. For. Councillor Zorowski. For the motion. Councillor Whitman. Yes. Councillor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Outhill. Yes. Mayor Savage. Yes, for the motion. The motion carries. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Uh, colleagues, moving ahead to 9.3, members of council, 931, Councillor Hensby, infrastructure funding application for active transportation enhancement, enhancement Mineville Road, Councillor Hensby. Well, thank you much, Mr. Mayor. I just read the motion of the Health Action Council request a staff report regarding the submitting an infrastructure funding application to the province of Nova Scotia for active transportation enhancement to the Mineville Road. Second. Seconded by Councillor Rich. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Uh, just to advise Council that the province has decided to totally repay the Mineville Road from Lake Echo East Press and right through to Lawrencetown. That's a 7.1 kilometer stretch of road. Uh, this is an opportunity that uh, we only comes by every 20 years when they're doing a major repaving of a street. Um, this is an opportunity, you know, to, to see if we can partner with the province in regards to the upgrading of the street. Um, we've seen this community of Mineville is very active in its, in its area, a lot of walking and, and cycling. 
There's a lot of uh, amenities along the numbers, the Mineville Road. It connects a number of the community parks as well as their playground, as well as the local church and um, and, health, and health clinic. It also connects uh, towards the, uh, the convenience store in East Preston, as well as towards the school in the Bell Park area. So having uh, four and a half kilometers of the seven kilometers paved is, is, is the core area where the residential uh, area is. and. Uh, it be greatly enhanced uh, for for the community. I believe in your correspondence. You'll also see letters from the local MLA Kevin Murphy, as well as the uh, Mineville Community Association, as well as the, the Mineville Health Clinic, all in support of this initiative. So, I'd ask for council support to have the staff report forward it to, to see if we can find any resources to help partner. Like I said, this once in a 20-year opportunity. Thank you. Sorry, I was wondering why you weren't answering me, Councillor Austin. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll support a request for a staff report. I'd be um, keen to see what our AT staff have in terms of uh, where this would fit in our priorities. Mainly, I wanted to buzz in um, just because I, I, I find it very unfortunate that here we have a provincial road and a provincial project and yet um, we are in the mode of well if you want any AT consideration on this uh, dear municipality you have to be the one that, to do it. The province really should stop being Department of Highways and adopt a complete streets framework of their own so when they're doing these projects these would be built in since it is fundamentally their road um, but I'm happy to support Councilor Hensby to look at a staff report I just think it's unfortunate that we are still uh, unless it's a road the province it's hard to get the province to be interested. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stretch. Uh, just for clarification, uh, through you, Your Worship, to Councillor Hensby, this is for an additional couple of feet on the outside. Is that what we're speaking of? Yes, sir. So yeah, so this really will be a, a pseudo sidewalk, if you would. I know that, uh, you know, a number of years ago uh, when we did major paving around uh, uh, the square of Middle Muscadaba, they did that uh, same type of thing. Uh, and it's worked very well. It, uh, in lieu of sidewalks, has provided uh, similar uh, walking opportunities. At that time, there was no request of the municipality to do it. The province just uh, widened that out a couple of feet and did it. Now, my father was minister at the time, so I think he just told them to do it, but it bothers me that we have to go to this length, and I kind of agree with some of the others that uh, we shouldn't have to be doing this, and really they should do it for the people of the community. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor uh, Nickel. So this is for a staff report, so it'd be worth having that conversation because there's been two figures floated around. And um, I'm sorry, but Councillor Hensby, when the local MLA for the area endorses their own road, it's kind of like for active transportation, it kind of falls on, on deaf ears because it is their road. And to Councillor Austin's point, why wouldn't they be putting an active transportation piece to it? A paved shoulder, they had them around the province, just as you know. So I just wondered why they wouldn't put it or even consider it, given that it was a res it's a residential area. So I'm hoping that that comes like there's more as to what the amount is, because it's just, yes, it's a, a little strip, but it's interesting. When I tried to have this done on Bissett Road, as you know, Councillor Hensby, they couldn't do it. And that is an active transportation route. Okay. So we'll look for more information. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. And I believe that in regards to Visit Road, uh, is not a municipal road, not a provincial road. So that would be more of our responsibility. But th this here is outside the service uh, urban core area. Uh, the province has committed uh, under the, the, the Bicycle Nova Scotia, the Blue Route, and through the blue route across the province, they are going to be paving the shoulder of that highway wherever it goes through the province whenever they upgrade. They, uh, from my particular district, that is highway number seven from East Preston right through to uh, to um, Ecom Seacom uh, West. And so hopefully that we'll see that. I've seen some uh, paving of the shoulders uh, through Lake Echo. They did 6.6 .6 kilometers through there. They've done a stretch in, in Sheet Harbor when we did the sidewalk project. And then the last couple of years they've done from Watt section to West Quaddy. So the province is keeping its commitment to the Blue Route uh, area, but this uh, particular road, the Mineville Road, is off just off the Blue Route. 
but uh, we know there's a lot of cycling going on in the communities uh, around the Romineville and the 207 highway through Lawrencetown and stuff. So it is a it is a very popular area road to go. Uh, in regards to um, you know cost sharing of paving and stuff is something that we've been I've been advocating for a number of years now that we should take an opportunity to look at these when they do come up. Just like I said earlier, it's a once in 20 year uh, opportunity. Um, we talked about an active transportation strategy. There's going to be a meeting coming up on June 11th for the, the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities Active Transportation Virtual Committee, a town hall meeting on this discussion. I would hope that we can have that discussion more with the province. There are other examples. Uh, I know Chester had done it on Highway 333, uh, Highway Number 3. They did a cost share with the province with paving the shoulders down through there. So it, it has been done in other municipalities across the province, and it's an opportunity for us to look at it here. Uh, here we just recently had a, a, a multi-million dollar uh, contribution from federal and provincial governments for a AAA bike, bikeway network. That's all urban. Why can't we find just a little bit of money to do a rural, rural uh, active transportation um, connection? So I ask for your support for this report. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Ready for the question, colleagues? Cheryl? Councillor Strutt. For the motion. Councillor Hens. Affirmative. Councillor Karsten. Councillor Nichol. Yes, for a report. Councillor Austin. In favor. Councillor Mancini. Uh, for the motion, please. Councillor Mason. For the motion. Councillor Smith. For the motion. Councillor Cleary. Yes. Councillor Walker. For. Councillor Adams. For. Councillor Zarowski. For the motion. Councillor Whitman. Yes. Deputy Mayor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Arthur. Yes. And Mayor Savage. Yes, for the motion. The motion carries. Thank you, Councillor Hensby. Colleagues, we've uh, passed 10.1. Um, and I'm going to come back to another item from this morning in a bit. Um, but we're going to go to 10.2. Councillor Zarowski, uh, Blue Mountain Birch Cove. Uh, Councillor Zarowski. Uh, should I put the motion on the floor to begin with, uh, Mr. Mayor? Yes, please. All right. Um, I move that Halifax Regional Council request a staff report for a plan for the creation of a park at the Blue Mountain Birch Cove Wilderness Reserve. I request that this report include considerations for projected land acquisition needs for the creation of the park, expected costs associated with land acquisition, projected costs of maintenance of the park before, during, and after the acquisition of the necessary lands, staff requirements to maintain the park, boundaries of the park, timeline for the creation of the park, potential sources of funding for the creation and maintenance of the park and miti uh, mitigation of threat to, uh, to the park at this juncture. The staff report is request required because of the changing nature of our municipal budgets and because of the threats to the existing forest fire, existing from for, uh, forest from fire, pests and overuse. Now, second, just second, this second by Mancini. Uh, I think Councillor Adams had asked to second that, Tony. No problem, that's fine. Uh, Councilor Zarowski, anything else on it? Richard? Um, if I could just speak to this, uh, I, it won't be long. Um, this is something that's been on the um, on the books since about 2006, if I remember correctly, which uh, well predates my time on council. And there have been so many changes to Blue Mountain Birch Cove that it's difficult to keep track of. And one of the worst kept secrets is the fact that we do want to establish a park there and acquire uh, private lands for the creation of the park to uh, circle and protect the wilderness reserve. Now, what's important about this is the fact that what we have is headland waters that will not be protected unless, and these are according to the environmental assessments, unless we acquire the lands. And that makes it important for us to have a plan. And right now, um, Things have changed in terms of how much the park is or the potential park is being used. And there is no jurisdiction over 
uh, the properties in terms of monitoring, in terms of um, making sure that things are cleaned out. Uh, just in the last couple of weeks, I've been posting a number of forest fires in the area that have been put out. Um, fire services have been called. If, if we do get a fire there, not only will we lose the potential park, it will also be a threat to a lot of residents in and around that area, including Kingswood, uh, Timberley, uh, the new Larry uh, Utec subdivisions, and uh, Saskatoon Drive. A lot of downsides for not monitoring this important area. And the potential for the park is enormous. Um, and we see that in the increased use. What's happened is that with the lockdown, more and more folks have been deciding to make use of our wilderness reserve. And they've been going through private property. They've been going in through many, many other areas that just don't have proper access to the potential park. And so what this proposal is intended to do is to clarify uh, where we are at this juncture. We're not at the same point that we were four years ago when we had instructed staff to acquire the lands and to create the park. It's a very dynamic situation. And what we're trying to do is garner as much information as we can. I would also add that I would like this uh, report to be made public as well. I think that's an important constituent in this so that everyone un understands the direction that city and staff are going in the creation of this particular park. And I, I would just add to um, the final point of this uh, is that a plan is the starting point for anything that we would do. And there has been so much confusion around the many different plans that we've had that I think the purpose of this one, and it's timely given the fact that we have COVID um, changing the nature of how we value and use our uh, green spaces and public spaces. Um, right now, I'm, I'm looking at upwards of 50 cars, maybe 60 cars in and along Con Collins Road. Uh, we've got a lot of folks coming in through Saskatoon Drive with most of them closed. So it's important that we have a plan that tells us where the access points would be and all the variations involved in this. So it, it's, I, I realize that uh, it's just going to add to the complexity of the many different plans that we have there uh, out right now, but I think we need something that's definitive at this particular time so that we can stop nailing jello to the wall. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Ready for the question, colleagues? Councillor Stretch. For the motion. Councillor Hansby. Affirmative. Councillor Carson. Councillor Nichols. Yes. Councillor Austin. Yes. <laughs> Councillor Mancini. I support no more nailing jello to the wall. <laughs> Councillor Mason. Uh, for the motion. Councillor Smith. For the motion. Councillor Cleary. For the motion, but I'm also for jello. <laughs> Councillor <laughs> Walker. For. Councillor Adams. For. Councillor Sarowski. A jello less affirmative. Councillor Whitman. Yes. Deputy Mayor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Outfit. He's putting us on, but yes, I will vote for it. Mayor Savage. Yes, for the motion. That carries. Thank you, Councillor Zorowski. Now, colleagues, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillors. We need to, I'm told, actually ratify the um, amendment this morning, Cheryl, correct? Yes. That we spent a few minutes talking about. So um, it's in the chat. Uh, Deputy Mayor, do you wish to, or uh, who would be Councillor Clary, perhaps? Maybe that's something that you would, would want to uh, lead us on. I would be happy to, Your Worship. Uh, so 
I move that the budget can everyone. Where's my motion? So I. I'm looking at. Uh, oh, wow. Ah, OK, it's longer than I thought. So the budget committee two recommends, I guess motions, right? that. Um, yeah, I guess we're going to do this as two motions in the ratification or one. Well, they both passed, so I guess it's just the, ratifying the one. The motion to rescind a decision to reserve fund the armor vehicle. Yes. Okay. So I move uh, that council rescind the decision. The OK. OK. Uh, so based on the recommendation of the budget committee, I move that council rescind the decision uh, to reserve fund the armored vehicle and return the funds $500,000 to the vehicle fleet and equipment reserve Q531 and uh, further include. Uh, do I stop there for the first vote? Yes. We split it at, does it? We split it this morning. Should it be split? Yeah, here? I'll read the whole. I'll read the whole thing and then we can split it. No, uh, Councillor Cleary, why don't you? Why don't we split it? Uh, it's been asked to be split. Okay. That's correct. So then right? I'll stop there yeah. to uh, so, basically unfund the uh, the yeah. ARV. On the first part of the motion, ready for the question, colleagues? It, is Councillor Smith going to second it? I just because the first part. Sure. It doesn't doesn't matter. Sure. Seconded by Thank Councillor you. Smith. Ready for the vote. Councillor Stretch. For the motion. Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Councillor Carson. <laughs> Councillor Nickel. Yes. Councillor Austin. Yes. Councillor Mancini. For the motion. Councillor Mason. For the motion. Councillor Smith. For the motion. <coughs> Councillor Cleary. Yes. Councillor Walker. For. Councillor Adams. Against. Councillor Zarowski. For the motion. Councillor Whitman. Yes. Count Deputy Mayor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. And Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Outfit. Voting yes. And Mayor Savage. For the motion. Motion carries with one dissenting vote. Thank you, colleagues. I'll move now that uh, based on the Budget Committee recommendation, Council um, further include the following funding in the recast 2021 budget. $53,500 in programming dollars for the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, $25,000 for special projects, plus $11,000 to support business units to advance public safety strategy actions, uh, and those are for the Public Safety Office, and use the remaining $300,000 to support anti-Black racism efforts and initiatives with funding to come from General Contingency Reserve Q421. Seconded by Councillor Smith. Seeing no questions, uh, we'll vote. Sorry, my mic, my mic was frozen. Yep, second. Councillor Stretch. For the motion. Councillor Hensby. Affirmative. Councillor Karsten. Councillor Nickel. Yes. Councillor Austin. In favor. Councillor Mancini. In favor of the motion. Councillor Mason. For the motion. Councillor Smith. For, for the motion. Councillor Cleary. Yes. Councillor Walker. For. Councillor Adams. For. Councillor Zorowski. For the motion. Councillor Whitman. Yes. Deputy Mayor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Outhit. Yes. And Mayor Savage. For the motion. The motion carries. Thank you, Councillor Cleary. All right, call. Let's take a breath and have a look. There's a couple of items in camera. I would ask you to have a look. Uh, is there anything we can do without going in camp?
Go for number one, Stevie. Mm-hmm. Got to stretch one to 11.1. Yes, I, 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 you read it, Dave. No, no, it's, it's yours, ba- it's your baby. I don't have it in front of me. If somebody put it on the chat, I'll read it. I'll be happy to move it for you, Councillor Stretch. I have Please. it in front of me. Uh, 11 uh, 1. Uh, so I move that uh, Halifax Regional Council adopt the recommendations as outlined in the private and confidential staff report dated t- April 27, 2020, and to not release the private and confidential staff report dated April 27, 2020, to the public. And I'll second it. Thank you. Okay, who was that that seconded it? I didn't recognize that person. Councillor Stretch. That was me, Steve Stretch. I got you. <laughs> Uh, I'm inclined to say something, but that would give it away. No, so, don't do um, it. <laughs> okay. Ready for the question, colleagues? Question. Councillor Stretch? For the motion. Councillor Hensby. Bob Farmer, no. Councillor Carson. Councillor Nickel. Yes. Councillor Austin. In favor. Councillor Mancini. For the motion. Councillor Mason. <laughs> Councillor Mason. For the motion. Councillor Smith. For the motion. Councillor Cleary. Yes. Councillor Walker. For. Councillor Tsarowski. For the motion. Councillor Adams. For. Councillor Whitman. Yes. Deputy Mayor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor out here. Yes. Mayor Savage. For the motion, that carries, thank you. Mr. Mayor, I'll try 11.2 if you'd like. Okay, Councillor Mason. I move that Halifax Regional Council 1 adopt the recommendation as outlined in the private confidential staff report dated February 26, 2020, and 2 not release private confidential staff report dated February 26, 2020 to the public. I so move. Councillor Nichols, second. Councillor Cleary. Seconded by Councillor Nickel Cleary. Councillor Nickel, I think I heard first. Ready for the question, colleagues? Question. Councillor Stretch. For the motion. Councillor Hensby. Against the motion. Councillor Carson. Councillor Nickel. Yes. Councillor Austin. In favor. Councillor Mancini. For the motion. Councillor Mason. For the motion. Councillor Smith. For the motion. Councillor Cleary. Yes. Councillor Walk. For. Councillor Adams. For. Councillor Jurowski. I am for the motion. Councillor Whitman. Councillor Whitman. Deputy yes, Mayor Blackburn. Yes. Oh. Deputy Mayor Blackburn. Voting yes on the motion. Councillor Russell. For the motion. Councillor Outfit. Yes. And Mayor Savage. Yes. So that motion carries. Um, and it's good. Um, we have no other agenda items before we do notices of motion. Cheryl, I don't believe we didn't add anything else. We've ratified. Uh, colleagues, notices of motion. Uh, it's Tim, I have one. Councillor Outfit. Thank you, Mayor. Take notice that the next regular meeting, uh, regional council meeting, sorry, is to be held on Tuesday, June the 23rd, 2020. I intend to request a staff report that outlines the history and identifies possible land use options for HRM owned lands located off Shore Drive in Bedford 
a portion of PID 4091861. Thank you. Show of hands, anyone? who else? Great here. I have Councilor, a notice, Mr. Mayor. I got Councillor Mason, then Councillor Austin. Uh, take notice that at the next meeting of Halifax Regional Council to be held June 23rd, 2020, I propose to move a motion to rescind the contribution agreement terms and conditions outlined in Table 1 of the staff report dated June 18th, 2018 and incorporate by reference in Part 2 of the motion for Item 14.2.3 from December 11, 2018, meeting of Halifax Regional Council to be able to amend the contribution agreement terms and conditions based on a request from the YMCA of Greater Halifax Dartmouth. Councillor Austin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, take notice that, the, uh, that at the next meeting of Halifax Regional Council to be held on June 23rd, 2020, I propose to introduce a policy pursuant to Section 335 of the Halifax Municipality Charter Administrative Order SC94, the purpose of which is to close a portion of Mount Hope Avenue, Dartmouth, described as Parcel X. Thank you. Anybody uh, Mr. else? Mayor. Mr. Mayor, it's Councillor yeah. Cleary. Councillor Cleary. Uh, I'm just going to do this on the fly a little bit because I'm trying to find my document here and it's not coming up. Uh, so take notice at the next meeting of Halifax Regional Council, uh, I intend to move the following motion. Uh, that uh, section 2CA.1 of Administrative Order 17 be amended uh, to freeze councillor uh, or council member remuneration uh, from uh, November 1st, 2020 to October 31st, 2021. Anybody else? Colleagues, um, whatever your opinion, today was a good day of discussion. And uh, I think we can all be proud of uh, whether you agree or not with the ultimate decisions. And I do want to take a moment again to thank um, all of you. But I want to thank staff, uh, uh, Jacques, uh, Jane, I was kidding about how many uh, budget meetings we've had this year, but it's a lot. It's put a lot of taxation upon us. No, no not taxation, but we've held the line. But it's put a lot of stress on, on everybody, but our staff in particular, I know you would all agree with me, our staff have done an awesome job um, accepting the work that we've done as we have accepted the work that they have done. So um, let's... Uh, either applaud or show a thumbs up for the great work of Jock and Jane and their team uh, here in the city. And uh, COVID has been a tough thing for us all to deal with and will continue to be. But I want to tell you that I think our city has survived it better than most because of the great work and effort that uh, everybody's put into it. That's all I got to say. I so Mr. Mayor. I'm closing with a statement. Our next meeting, Sean, uh, Cheryl is in two weeks, the 23rd of June. Get out Mr. and enjoy Mayor. the sun, folks, and uh, just remember, Black Lives Matter. Mr. Mayor. Carol? Yes? I just wanted, because I know with the budget, there's always a statement that's done through corporate communications, but on the matter of the armored vehicle, will there be a statement made? Um, there's been a statement on the budget. I don't know about that. I can't answer that. Jock, is there... We'll uh, we'll have a conversation with corporate communications and let you know. I haven't uh, we haven't had that conversation yet, and with and with of course police services. All right. Anybody else? David, show us your T-shirt, David, before we go. I move to adjourn. Then <laughs> we adjourn two weeks. And you got it. You racism. Go abs. <laughs>